hi everybody, I want to talk about Zelda. I like Zelda, if you haven't noticed. And when talking Zelda, it's hard not to mention what many consider to be the series' pivotal factor, the dungeons. Dungeons are almost as synonymous with Zelda as key phrases like exploration and have been a series staple since the very original. I doubt I need to explain how important to the series they are. I've been doing quite a lot of reminiscing lately, and one game's dungeons keep standing out to me as such a turning point for the series. I'm just gonna go ahead and gush about Ocarina of Time for a while. Now in today's video I just want to start at the beginning and talk about the game's first dungeon. But before we dive into that, a bit more on why I chose to start here with Ocarina of Time. Do not get me wrong, the first four games in this series had some really great dungeon design, but there is something about the shift in level design from 2D to 3D that I think was really important for the series. In the original quartet of Zeldas, graphically and thematically speaking, there wasn't as much depth to the dungeons from what I can tell. There is really fantastic level design here. Don't get me wrong, but when looking at things like architecture, ambience, and in-universe lore, they don't carry the same weight. This is not a dig at the previous games. In fact, Link to the Past is one of my all-time favorite games and will always hold a special place in my heart, but objectively, Ocarina of Time really nails this concept better and had a long-lasting effect on the series as a whole. Speaking of objectivity, I'm just gonna say this as a bit of a disclaimer here, that I am biased as hell towards Ocarina of Time. Honestly, this game came out when I was just a wee child and was definitely one of the most important games of my formative years. Anyways, I've gone on long enough. You're all here for the dungeon appreciation, so here we go. Starting this little series off, let's jump into the Great Deku Tree. first level has a lot resting on it. It's a player's first impression and sets the precedent for the rest of the game, so it's important to get that first dungeon just right. Thematics, difficulty, story, teaching, these are all things that must properly be executed in order for a game's introduction to be successful. You have to sell your players on this game. I'm happy to say that Ocarina of Time accomplishes this pretty well. Now personally, I'm a fan of when a game just drops you right into the action. Breath of the Wild opens up giving you free reign over the Great Plateau. I have a video on that by the way. Which is a large wide open space to let you learn the game. Majora's Mask begins with a literal chase. A Link to the Past brings you into Hyrule Castle to rescue Zelda which sets the story up and gives you an action packed intro dungeon. And Zelda 1 just drops you into the open and says, good luck! Meanwhile, games like Twilight Princess, Skyward Sword, and Wind Waker make you sort of do your chores before you can get to the first dungeon. Literally, in Twilight Princess's case. So as for Ocarina of Time, I think it's honestly a good balance between these two styles. You're not really dropped into the action, but the tasks that you have to complete before reaching the dungeon are really just equipping yourself with a sword and shield, which is fairly unintrusive for both new players learning the controls, as well as for returning players trying to get through this section in a timely manner. I only mention this because for Ocarina of Time, the Deku Tree is still really your first impression of the game, while in a case like Twilight Princess, you may have been playing the game four hours before reaching the first dungeon, and for me, a veteran of the series, I hate that in an otherwise stellar game, I'm here breathing a sigh of relief reaching that first dungeon and saying, oh finally, I made it to the good part. Here in Ocarina of Time, that progression feels far more natural and you really step inside with a sense of wonder. By the way, that sense of wonder and mystery is aided further by Koji Kondo's amazing music. The man is a legend for a reason. He's a genius. The goal here was to give a more ambient, 
atmospheric feel, and each and every dungeon in this game really nails that. While I think the dungeon music in the game's second act is much stronger musically, I can't deny the mysterious vibe that this track offers. Now this dungeon is really easy, and can be completed in mere minutes by some players, but that's sort of the point here. This is the first dungeon, and for Link, the first real threat he's facing, and as such there is a lot of room for forgiveness here. I don't think that it was any mistake that many of the item pickups in this dungeon are in the form of grass, which will regrow rather quickly after you cut it so that you can cut it again and get more items, rather than the clay pots that we find in so many more places throughout the game. The dungeon also has plenty of recovery hearts to find, and they aren't exactly hidden either. The enemies also mostly consist of those which are tethered in place, making them great starter enemies. Deku Babas, Deku Scrubs, even the Skulchulas, having these enemies being mostly stationary really eases players into the combat, which was especially important when this game was new because it invented lock-on targeting in 3D, so this was all very new to everybody. For new players, these enemies are simple and can't pursue you if you need to make a retreat. Meanwhile, for returning players, they're an unintrusive obstacle. Structure-wise, the dungeon is very simple. Again, ideal for new players, but without being boring for returning players. I also think that having the dungeon laid out in such a vertical structure was a very smart move to showcase how redefined Zelda as a series would be after transitioning to 3D. While not all of the game's dungeons are as strikingly vertical in their design as this one, when you're used to playing only top-down 2D Zelda, seeing this for the first time really is a great showcase that this is a new era, and while the dungeon is certainly large and open, they really guide you through the path in a linear way in order to teach you the game's mechanics. When you enter, you can see there are multiple paths before you, but you can't really pursue any of them. The hole in the floor is covered by a giant spider web, so the only path ahead is up to the second floor, where you'll find the map. If you try to climb any farther up, you'll get attacked by these wall chillas. So again, the only viable route is through the door on the second floor, through which you will find an easy to deal with Deku Scrub. You don't even have to attack him, just block his attack and he will yield. In that very next room, you'll find the game's first dungeon item, the Slingshot. Of course, you should already have the Deku Nuts and Sticks by this point, but the Slingshot is far more important as a starter item since it's going to introduce us to first-person aiming in 3D space and it's going to do so in a controlled environment. This is a classic Metroid move, by the way, giving you a new item or ability and then locking you in the room, forcing you to use your new item to get out. In this case, it's simply shooting the ladder, then shooting the Walchulas in the main room to be able to actually progress further in the dungeon. This is the game easing you into slightly more difficult situations and teaching you how to use this new item without giving you a huge blatant, this is how you use the slingshot tutorial. I'm sorry, I keep bragging on Twilight Princess. I do love that game. I mean, it does give you this huge annoying text box telling you how to equip the item, which it does with every single item that you get. I'm not really a fan of that. But aside from just what buttons to press, the way it teaches you to actually use the item in application is really well done. Now that you can progress to the top floor, you'll find a fairly simple puzzle room, if you can call it that, where you'll obtain the compass. From here, the dungeon sort of shifts gears. It's taught you a lot of the basics, and it says, okay, you've got the slingshot, map, compass, you're good from here. And I like that change of pace. It's held your hand all the way up to this point and funneled you up here. And now, it forces you to think for yourself. You know that big spider web? I think placing that right by the entrance was an intentional choice as well. Because that's one of the first things you'll see in the dungeon, and so it's something that really stands out. You've also got the map and compass telling you, I mean, if you checked the map at least, you've explored everything on the top three floors, and all that you have left to explore is in the basement below the first floor. So it's not a stretch for players to have to think about how they're going to get past that spiderweb and down into the basement. And since the game has funneled us all the way up to the top of this huge open room, we jump. Ah! 
Thank goodness for the water to cushion our landing. The basement is really straightforward all in all. There's the illusion of branching paths in this first room once again, but you actually can't reach one of them, so there's only one way to actually go. And following this, there's a very small series of rooms with the mini puzzles. Again, staying true to the idea of making new players stop and think about operating in 3D space, while returning players can just zip through it quickly. I have always been mildly confused about how there's things like doors and operating machinery inside of Link's giant talking tree dad, but I don't know. I don't think Nintendo wants us to think about that too hard. Another thing that always bothers me is that there's this bombable wall here. Bombable walls are nothing new to Zelda, but putting it here in this dungeon before we can even get bombs forces completionists like me to return here and go to the very farthest corner of this dungeon just to get a single gold sculptula. After making a loop through the basement rooms, you'll come back to that main water room where you fell in before, where you can now push a block to make a path to the torch, so you can easily burn that last spider web. Keep in mind, when you first entered this room and activated that torch, it specifically showed it burning a spider web to give you this idea that you can come back here and use fire on the spider webs later. Hopefully you've also been paying attention to what the Deku scrubs were telling you because you'll need to defeat these three other scrubs in the right order to get into the boss room. No big key for Little Link, unfortunately. Entering this boss room is one of those things that always stands out to me as one of those super cool moments in the game. It's cinematic in that opening cutscene, and this room really feels like a dark, dank, natural location. Which makes sense because we're pretty deep underground at this point. And the idea here that you can't see the boss when you enter while it crawls around somewhere out of sight? Childhood chills, I tell you. Yeah, the dungeon boss doesn't come out swinging like other bosses in the series as soon as you enter the room. To initiate battle, you'll have to make eye contact with Goma, which I feel pulls you into the world really well. That's immersion, you have to literally make eye contact. <laughs> Goma as a starter boss is also really great. Goma has appeared in Zelda 1 and Link's Awakening already, but her design here is her first 3D appearance and I love it. She's genuinely got a terrifying design. Who thought it was okay to make little child Link go up against this giant arachnid? Goma looks threatening and sets the mood perfectly, but overall, it's a pretty easy fight for experienced players. You can fight her on the ground okay, but when she crawls up to the ceiling, the game sets the trend of making you use the dungeon item and the skills you've learned up to this point in the boss fight. So in order to strike Goma down off the ceiling, you'll need to use your slingshot. It won't take long to defeat her, but I've always felt that this particular fight was more about laying groundwork than actually meaning to be challenging. Again, it's the first boss in the game, the first boss in all of 3D Zelda, so it's more important that this fight teaches you than it is for it to be hard. Oh, and the way her body burns away like that? I've always been a fan of that. It's gross, but in the right kind of way. After getting your heart container, which is the Zelda growth plan, you get to warp right out of the dungeon and listen to the Great Deku Tree's exposition. And then he dies. I actually really love that he gives you the creation story here before imparting the Kokiri Emerald. Again, immersion. This is all meant to pull you into the world of Hyrule, and it does it masterfully. Also, having the Deku Tree just die here is pretty important thematically for this incarnation of Link, but more on that in a later video. So overall, Inside the Great Deku Tree does its job really well. It's not Zelda's most compelling or interesting dungeon, but its goal is to be an ease of entry into the game. It teaches you without being super in your face about it all. Now people will complain about Navi and yeah. She will chime in here and there throughout the dungeon, but her dialogue here is more to support and reinforce the player rather than blatant hand-holding. She doesn't pop out and tell you to go climb that wall, but only when you approach the wall to try it does she come and confirm 
that you can. And while her telling you that yes, you can open doors is pretty obvious really, it doesn't detract from the experience in all that big of a way. So that's the start to this little series of videos I'm doing. Fittingly, the start to The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. And it's one of the all-time greats for a reason. Its timeless game design that respects players' intuition and intelligence is on full display here while they ease you into navigating a 3D space. I like it a lot. I think I take for granted just how much story, setup, and side content there is in between the first two dungeons in Ocarina of Time. After finishing watching your talking tree dad just die in front of you, you really get your first chance to step out of Kokiri Forest. Before leaving, we get this emotional scene with Saria giving us her ocarina. She's really Link's best friend, and she's very perceptive, somehow knowing that Link is off to face his destiny. She accepts this, but there is a certain sadness about this moment that I really appreciate. Finally, we get to set foot onto Hyrule Field and the feeling here of embarking on your- oh good god, not you. When you get to the lively, bustling castle town, you also have a good deal of side content available. One of my personal favorites is the shooting gallery here. You also meet Malon here, who is kind of important by the way. Finally, up to Hyrule Castle- NO! Go away! Okay, finally up to Hyrule Castle, Malon will give us this weird egg, which we use to wake up Talon, her dad, and sneak right into Hyrule Castle to talk to Zelda. I really love this dialogue here with Zelda, especially how we learn that Zelda, like Link, has had premonitions in her dreams. Though while Link's dreams were almost like a small snapshot of a specific moment, Zelda's dreams are more symbolic and vague, with dark clouds, bright lights, and shining figures. She seems to have an understanding of what these events may mean, and the idea of these two kids conspiring like this feels like some kind of medieval fantasy John Hughes movie. I like it a lot. So she tells you about the Triforce, and we learn that our villain Ganondorf is planning to steal it. So the plan they hatch? Gather the remaining spiritual stones, since the Deku Tree already gave you one, you've only got two to go, and open the Door of Time and get the Triforce before Ganondorf does. So now we have an idea of what our actual goal is for now. Now again, I almost forget how much side content there is to do here. We can get an empty bottle in Kakariko Village, get ourselves the Hylian Shield, learn the Sun Song, find several Gold Scotchillas, and way more. Even the guard at the gate in Kakariko will initiate the mask trading questline. Anyhow, getting up the mountain, we're treated further to some exposition with the Gorons. Darunia, in particular, is pretty peeved because, like the Deku Tree, Ganondorf has apparently been around town and is trying to extort the Gorons into giving him the spiritual stone. So after cheering Daruni up with some sick beats, you agree to help with a bit of an infestation problem the Gorons are having. This is all stuff to do before you can even get to the dungeon, but it's all important. It helps motivate you to actually do this stuff if you know why you're doing it. Alright, on to the dungeon itself. After blowing up this huge rock, we can finally enter Dodongo's Cavern. In my last video about the Deku Tree, I mentioned one of the main themes of the level's design was the verticality. This is used pretty nicely in Goron City as well, but not as prominently in this dungeon. There's only two floors here, as opposed to the previous dungeon's four. It's still here though, but more so than the previous dungeon is this very real sense of interconnectivity in its design. The rooms crisscross each other and connect back in a way that really makes this dungeon feel more natural and real. It's linear in its progression, but in its actual layout it essentially has rooms that all branch from the main central room, which makes sense considering this is not just any dank dark cave, but a quarry for the Gorons to mine for food. It's nice that the dungeon design reflects the in-universe lore behind it. Once more, the music is here to provide a great sense of atmosphere as well. There's not really much in the way of any discernible rhythm, but instead we have these eerie echoes and cave sounds. I 
think I took this sound design for granted when I was younger, but if you listen to this track with headphones, I tell you, mm. The big central room is a great room to have as the dungeon entrance. It's an awesome first impression of this dungeon and what it's all about. Also having a bombable wall as the very first obstacle is a good move. Right before we got here, Darunia gave us the Goron bracelet, allowing us to use bomb flowers. Now we're in a room with nothing but a couple of these bomb flowers and a suspicious looking wall, so player intuition is well respected here. In the main central room we have the aforementioned branching paths, as well as a handful of bombable walls. Immediately on the west side of the room we can find the dungeon map behind one of these destructible walls. There's also some Deku scrubs who will sell you items, but they're not important. The door on the west side is locked, this tunnel is too high up for Link to reach, and so the door to the east is our only viable route. Also take note of the enemies we're going to encounter along the way here as well. Our first enemy is the Beemos, who is stuck in place with limited range, continuing the stationary enemy trend from the last dungeon. But that pretty well ends here in the central room. Immediately in the next room we encounter these little larva dodongos. These guys aren't challenging, but they do actually move and come at you, plus they explode upon dying, so the game is nudging you into these more challenging combat situations. We also meet a couple of Keys in the next room who again are pretty harmless, but do require you to improve your aiming skills with the slingshot, or at least have good reaction time with your targeting. Entering the eastmost lava room, we get locked in and forced into a confrontation with two Lazalfos. They are a nice leap up in challenge from any previous enemies we've encountered up to this point. I think having these guys here who are more aggressive than any previous enemies, but also a little bit skittish, frequently retreating back and dodging your attacks, is a great way the game teaches you its combat mechanics in its show don't tell way. You can't button mash your way to glory here. You have to block their attacks, wait for an opening to strike, and be quick. That said, they probably won't be overwhelming to anybody, since they are at least courteous enough to attack you only one at a time. Moving on, we get another rather simple puzzle room requiring you to light some torches, but there are some adolescent dongos in our way this time. Again, great enemies to show don't tell you the combat mechanics, and further hone your skills. They're pretty slow, but only vulnerable from the back, so you have to make sure you line up your attacks correctly. Again, slowly easing up the challenge. After this room, we'll find a switch that opens the door on the west side of the main room, and the hallway loops back around to this opening that was too high to climb into before. So we've been looped back into the main room, but without the backtracking. Well done, dungeon designers. Crossing through the main room and through the west door, we'll find the compass and the stairs up to the second floor. Also, I feel like having this sequence where you have to set off these bombs in order to bring the stairs down was just the devs really trying to remind you that this game is in 3D. There's no other reason for them to linger on this staircase like this. Now that we're up to the second floor, we can cross the first of these two large bridges suspended over the main room, again with the interconnectivity that this dungeon does so well. We cross back to the east room and into the blade trap room. This room feels very classic Zelda to me, pushing a block, avoiding these spikes, all that good stuff. I like it. Also, trying to blow up this wall with the bomb was one of my childhood difficulties that I will never forget. Down the hallway, we'll come across the upper part of that lava room from before, where we'll have to fight two more Lazalfos. I love that these two rooms are connected to each other like this. They didn't have to make it that way, but it's such a nice detail. Looping back to the blade trap room, we reach the previously inaccessible ledge to find the dungeon item, bombs. I almost forget how late into the dungeon you actually get these, but at the same time we've been using the bomb flowers that the dungeon has provided for us pretty generously up until this point. The only difference now is that we get a bag of them that we can take with us, rather than being restricted to just what's in the room. Once more we'll come into the main room, but after pressing the switch down here, we'll create a shortcut back up to this point which is a great bit of forgiveness because if you fell down at this point, you'd have to backtrack quite a lot to get back up here. This stone tablet, L is real, gives us a pretty big hint on how to proceed to the next area of the dungeon. Much like the Deku Tree's basement, which is almost like a second act for the dungeon, we have to get through to the dungeon's northern section, through this big impressionable thing we see in the first room. I guess this is probably why they gave us the bomb bag so late in the dungeon as well 
Between this hint and the bombs being fresh on our mind, you should probably be able to work out how to open the path. While not quite as obvious in execution, the northern section of the dungeon also carries on the interconnected theme that we've seen up until this point. However, not in the way that it zigzags across the main room, but more so in that the path loops back around to this small switch room, which you'll need to get to the upper ledge to push the block down onto the switch. Now there's just one thing left. The reveal for the dungeon boss is far more cinematic and less immersive than the previous one. As soon as you drop in, you get this Jurassic Park vibe as massive footsteps approach you, and then the reveal of King Dodongo. Now the last time in the series the Dongos appeared was Zelda 1, when they looked like this and you could just cram a bomb in his mouth and be done with it. So this design is really impressive in comparison, though the concept art does it far more justice than the N64 really could. The vibe here is pretty good. This room's design limits your maneuverability by sticking this pool of lava here. And King Dodongo is so big he blocks almost the entire path. But this is sort of undermined by the fact that your shield is somehow so strong that he can roll right over you and you'll be just fine if you block. This fight also follows the trend set by the first dungeon in its pacing. You wait for your opening, use the dungeon item, then strike him with your sword while he's down. It's not a difficult fight at all, but hey, we're only in dungeon number two, so I get it. Once he's defeated, he'll get all dizzy and try to roll away, only to fall into the lava, somehow cooling it. I don't really know how that works. But hey, here's our heart container and it's out of the dungeon for us. Once warped out, Darunia greets us and is so happy that you cleared out the infestation that he gives you the second spiritual stone. We're now Darunia's sworn brother. Great. After the most relatable cutscene ever, in which Link wants to avoid being hugged, we're off. So that's the dungeon. Overall, this dungeon is not too hard, but it's a great step up from the introductory dungeon, and its zigzagging, crisscrossing, interconnected design makes it feel like a natural part of this world. Plus, its dark, lava-filled cave design is a great contrast to the green, earthy dungeon before it. Still, some of the best this game has to offer is yet to come, but I like this dungeon a lot, and it further reinforces the game's themes and supports the groundwork set up by its predecessor. In Link's quest to find the three spiritual stones before Ganondorf can, in collaboration with Zelda, we have collected both the spiritual stones of fire and the spiritual stone of the forest. All that remains in order to complete the mission Zelda set us out on is to find the spiritual stone of water. I appreciate that at this point, the game is not as directly ushering us to where we need to go. After coming out of the last dungeon, Darunia will suggest we visit the Great Fairy at the top of Death Mountain, but we aren't directly told where the next spiritual stone is. Navi will also chime in and offer the suggestion that Saria may know more info, and you can ask Saria for a more direct hint if you want to, but other than that, no. The game instead leaves it up to you to find your way at this point. It's not hard to find where to go, however, because aside from the plethora of side quests you can do at this time, story-wise, most of the areas kind of have nothing for you. If you explore the various paths out from Hyrule Field, you will find yourself unable to enter Gerudo Desert, and Lake Hylia just doesn't have much going on, aside from an empty bottle here that you can't even reach yet. And we've already covered things in Castletown, Kokiri Forest, and Death Mountain. There's a ton more side content to do as well before we need to do the dungeon. As far as mandatory stuff to complete, our list here is much shorter this time than the last dungeon. A peek at the map will show us a little blip off somewhere we haven't explored yet, but that's about it. So you'll probably find yourself going up to the previously inaccessible trail to Zora's River, which we can now get through because of the bombs we have. But oh no, not you again. Okay. 
Aside from being annoying and talking too much, I actually really dislike Kepora Gabor's dialogue here. Up until we ran into him, the game has shown us respect and allowed us to sort of find our own way here. And then he just straight up tells you, yep, go play the song at the waterfall, buddy. The text at the Sleepless Waterfall itself is already a big enough hint, in my opinion, that you need to play Zelda's lullaby here, but sure, spoil the fun of figuring it out ourselves, why don't you? Ugh. Anyways, the trek up Zora's River isn't all that hard, but it is quite fun, in my opinion. Once we make it inside Zora's domain, we'll find that the Zoras are all in a bit of a panic because their princess Ruto is missing. The king is completely overcome with worry, barely acknowledging that we're standing there, so we're forced to look around on our own. After completing the diving game and getting the silver scale, we can now dive deep enough to look at that suspicious underwater doorway thing here which we'll find is a shortcut to Lake Hylia. Hey, by the way, it totally makes sense that the Zora, being fish people, would use a huge underwater shortcut like this, but Link? He'd have to travel the entirety of Hyrule Field submerged underwater. How does he not drown? Is there just a current that is that fast? I don't know. At Lake Hylia, we can now dive deep enough to grab that empty bottle, only to find that it's not empty. There's a note from our missing Zora princess inside, that Jabu Jabu has eaten her. Showing the Zora King this letter, he is skeptical, but mentions that Ganondorf did stop by, and since then, Jabu Jabu, their patron deity, hasn't been himself. So he asks you to go check it out. The only way to get Jabu Jabu to open his big mouth is to feed him and just get swallowed ourselves, so we can use that empty bottle that the game has just provided us to grab a fish and offer it up. So I mentioned that the last two dungeons felt like pretty natural, real parts of this world, but this dungeon's design exemplifies this even further. We're literally inside of a giant fish. Apart from being absolutely f***ing disgusting, the dungeon accomplishes this idea very well. Its overall aesthetic is yucky in our flesh. The rooms all sort of pulsate and move. If you accidentally miss an enemy and strike the wall, the room tremors as if Jabu Jabu is in pain. The majority of enemies also appear to be parasite-like creatures. Though we still have some normal enemies, like Octorocks, not sure how they got in here. And what the heck is this Deku Scrub doing here? Do you live here, man? Were you burrowed in his flesh? Did you get swallowed as well and just decided to make the best of it and set up shop here just in case someone needed Deku Nuts? Also, the music here really deserves a shout out. While the previous two dungeon themes were mostly just ambient noises, this one is far more recognizable as actual music, but it still accomplishes adding to the atmosphere of this place. The beat sounds almost like it could be Jabu Jabu's heartbeat. And there's a bunch of sounds that could be like his stomach churning or indigestion or something. Again, conceptually, I find this all really gross. But that's exactly what they were going for, and they achieved this really effectively. Since we have to get gobbled up in order to enter the dungeon, it makes perfect sense that the entrance room is Jabu Jabu's mouth. Already the threat level is amped up here from the previous two dungeons. In the first room of the Great Deku Tree, the only enemies you'd find were these Deku Babas that were stationary and could only attack you if you engaged with them first. When entering Dodongo's Cavern, we just have a room with a bombable wall, so no enemies, just a simple obstacle. But here we are immediately accosted by two Octoroks who pop up and try and shoot you. They're easy to dispatch, but this definitely sets the tone of danger here. There's very few rooms in this dungeon where something isn't there to hurt you. After defeating these guys and these bubbles, <laughs> sorry, not those bubbles, I mean shabombs, we'll have to hit the switch on the ceiling, which, is it Jabu Jabu's uvula? Uh, uh, I don't know. So if I had to point out a theme in the overall design of these dungeons up until now, the Deku trees would be its verticality 
Dodongo's cavern would be its interconnectivity, which both reflect their in-universe purpose. Here it's a little harder to nail down. Instead of crisscrossing or ascending a central room, the dungeon's design is filled with hallways and branching paths. But this makes sense because we're also inside of a giant fish, not climbing a tree or exploring a quarry. So we don't really have a big central room per se. The room with the holes in the floor, which I'll be calling the pitfall room, is probably the closest that we have, but even then most of the paths don't actually branch off from here in the same way as they did in the previous two dungeons. Also, with all of these branching hallways, most of the dungeon is actually pretty accessible from the start, but you'll find that there isn't much you can actually do in most of the rooms at first. Usually, because of some slimy tentacle in your way. Gross. So, in this way, I like to imagine the dungeon as a tangled headphone cord. Just bear with me. Imagine you have a tangled headphone cord. The entire cord is visible and there. You can touch it, and but you have to find the starting point and slowly unravel it from there. Even though you could reach into the middle and just prod at any one part of the cord, it's not going to do you any good. So you have to slowly unravel it from one end until you've got the entire cord loose. It's a loose metaphor, but you get it, right? Rather than the dungeon being a series of rooms with small puzzles, the entire dungeon is more like one larger puzzle itself. So if you avoided the detours, you should quickly find yourself face to face with our missing princess. Ruto here is pretty rude, actually. She's really ungrateful and annoying. After talking to her, she'll be very dismissive of you and immediately fall through one of the room's pits into the room below. She's fine though. She tells you that she usually comes to feed Jabu Jabu, but something seems to be wrong with our big fishums here. She is also worried because she lost some precious stone of hers inside of Jabu Jabu's belly, and won't leave until she finds it. There's a kidney stones joke in here somewhere, right? So from here you have to literally carry her around the dungeon. Which does sound annoying, but she happens to be the game's most powerful weapon. You can just throw her at enemies, and you'll be able to kill most of them in one shot. She doesn't even seem bothered by it, or hurt. Which is great, because a lot of these enemies will actually hurt you if you try hitting them with your sword. Side note, but I've never understood why if Ruto gets submerged in water, or, or whatever bodily fluid it is, she just vanishes and respawns in the first room you found her in? She's a Zora. Water shouldn't be an issue for her, but oh well. Anyhow, bringing her back to the upper level and through the pitfall room, we'll find this set of branching hallways. At first, only two of the five rooms are unlocked. One has this giant parasite tentacle thing that you can't kill, and the other has a bunch of these stingers, which are pretty easy to deal with using your slingshot. Here we'll find the dungeon item, the boomerang. The boomerang is sort of a Zelda staple, and it retains its ability in this game not only as an offensive weapon, but as a way to fetch items that are out of reach. Now that we have the boomerang, things start to unravel more easily for us. We can kill these parasite tentacles, which all correspond to tentacles that block different paths in the dungeon. So for every one of these that we kill, we unravel more of what we can accomplish here. Working our way through the four remaining rooms, we'll find both the map and compass. Now just a nitpick here, but having these three things all so close together kind of removes the fun of opening up those treasure chests for me, because it's all just too much all at once. The map and compass in particular are literally in adjacent rooms. I just wish it had been better paced and spread out a bit but that's just me. Once we've worked our way through the five rooms at the far end of the dungeon, we make our very short backtrack to the pitfall room. Now that we've killed the last of those parasitic tentacles, a final pitfall is accessible here, which will drop us off onto the upper ledge of the basement room. Entering the next room, we'll find the spiritual stone of water. This is not only what we were after, but it's also that precious belonging of Ruto's that Jabu Jabu has swallowed. Now you can't actually reach it, so you have to throw Ruto up onto the platform to grab it. But before you can do anything, the platform raises up and Ruto is captured. When the platform comes back down, we'll have to fight this dungeon's mid-boss, the giant Octo. He's not too hard. In fact, the bigger danger is accidentally sidestepping into the spikes in here. You have to use your new boomerang to stun him, and then hit him in the back with your sword. While he probably won't do too much damage to you, 
he doesn't stay stunned for long, so you have to make sure that you're quick on your offense. Once he's defeated, we can ride the platform up to the second floor, make our way through this room with these weird meat cube things, ugh, and connect back to the elevator room near the entrance. It's a quick jaunt through this previously inaccessible door, through one last short room where you hit a switch using your boomerang, and you've unraveled the entire dungeon now. On to our final challenge. We don't get quite as cool an intro this time around. No dungeon boss lurking out of sight, or big Jurassic Park-like intro. But the short cutscene here still does its job. At first we see what appears to be more of the Bari, that's those little electric jellyfish guys we've been fighting, but then it turns out that they are actually just part of one larger creature, Baronade. <laughs> Unlike Goma and King Dodongo, Baronade has not appeared in any previous Zelda games, and his fight here is a real shakeup from what we're used to so far. Baronade seems to be some kind of parasite, with tubes latched onto and feeding off of Jabu Jabu. This fight is actually very fun in my opinion. The pace here is totally different from that of the previous two bosses, because Baronade is far more aggressive. He doesn't seem to waste time sort of milling about like the previous two bosses. You have to keep moving because Baronade will constantly attack you with either its electric blasts from its weird tubey things, or by sending out its jellyfish minion to get you. You'll need to first get it off of Jabu Jabu by slicing its tubes with your boomerang, but doing so doesn't make him less offensive. In fact, he'll then start using his spinning attack and rush at you. You can also kill those jellyfish if you want, in order to stop Baronade from being able to use them. Despite the pacing being different, this boss still does follow the established formula in which you'll need to use your new item, the boomerang, to stun him. This will open up the opportunity for you to do some damage with your sword. This isn't bad though, it's just building upon the established method by adding in a much greater level of threat. In short, Baronade is a far more threatening and a much greater challenge than the previous two bosses, and from an in-universe standpoint, he absolutely makes perfect sense to be the cause of poor Jabu Jabu's ailments. Once defeated, he'll explode into a disgusting, horrible mess. <laughs> We'll get our heart container, and find Ruto safe and sound. At first she complains that you kept her waiting, but once you warp out together, you'll find that she's warmed up to you. And even thought that you were actually pretty cool. Though it goes right over Link's head that it's a sign of engagement for the Zora, Ruto will give you the third spiritual stone. So that's the dungeon! Overall, I really like the layout and design of this dungeon. Rather than being a series of rooms with smaller puzzles, the dungeon design itself is like one larger puzzle to unravel. Though its aesthetic is in my opinion completely horrible and gross, that is just a testament to how well they accomplished what they were going for. And the concept of being inside of a large creature is also a really unique concept that we haven't really explored in Zelda since then. Despite me being a bit squeamish, I like it a lot. So here's the story so far. After both Link and Zelda had premonitions about Ganondorf basically being the worst dude ever, and having intentions to get his hands on the Triforce, which he'll use to conquer Hyrule, Zelda hatches a plan with Link. She will protect the Ocarina of Time, while Link gathers the remaining spiritual stones, which are the keys to accessing the Sacred Realm, where the Triforce sits. Having achieved that by way of completing the previous three dungeons, we set back to meet Zelda at Hyrule Castle. However, as we approach the castle gates, Link's nightmares unfold before him. A storm swells up in the skies above him, the gates to Hyrule Castle Town lower, just in time for a white horse to gallop away, riding the horse's Impa, clutching the Princess Zelda tight. Zelda, seeing Link, makes a last ditch effort to help him by throwing some object his way. It lands in the water behind him, and the horse carrying Zelda disappears out of sight. Just then Link feels a presence from behind him. It's Ganondorf atop a dark horse. 
This is the same guy we saw in the courtyard with the evil eyes that Link and Zelda have both had nightmares about. The same guy we've been told has cursed the Deku Tree, causing his death, attempted to extort the Gorons by cutting them off from their food source, and caused ailment to Lord Jabu Jabu. This evil man whose dark influence has been present at every turn of our adventure now stands before us demanding to know which way Zelda went. Link refuses to give him an answer, instead choosing to draw his sword. This amuses Ganondorf. He basically swats Link aside with a magical blast and sets off in pursuit of Zelda. Yikes. With Ganondorf gone, we can retrieve the item from the water, and we find that it's none other than the titular Ocarina of Time. Zelda has somehow left some kind of psychic message with the Ocarina in order to teach you the Song of Time. Hey, side note, but did y'all know about this soldier in the back alley of Castletown? You could totally skip right over him, but if you take that extra moment of exploration to go out of your way and talk to him, goodness, he just dies in front of you. Rated E for everyone, I guess, right? <laughs> Anyhow, now we have everything we need to complete the plan. With the three spiritual stones and the Ocarina of Time, we can proceed over to the Temple of Time and open the Door of Time. However, the Triforce doesn't seem to be here. Instead, we find that legendary blade, the one and only Master Sword. Pulling the blade shrouds us in a magical light, but despite this coolness, we have actually been misled. As we are pulled into the Sacred Realm, it turns out that Ganondorf actually followed us and stepped into the Sacred Realm too. When we come to, we find the Sage Roru. He dumps a bunch of exposition on us, but here's the cliff notes. As it turns out, Link was, indeed, the chosen hero of time. However, he was, for some reason, not old enough to actually wield the blade. So, it sealed his soul in the Sacred Realm for seven years. Now, we are old enough to hold the powerful blade, but that seven-year time gap has given Ganondorf more than enough time to conquer all of Hyrule. Our only chance of defeating him is to go awaken the other five sages at the various temples around Hyrule. Returning from the Sacred Realm back to the Temple of Time, we meet Sheik, a member of the Sheikah tribe. Sheik will give us a clue as to where we can find the temples, but gives us the hint to head over to Kakariko first to find the hookshot, otherwise we won't be able to even enter the first temple. Also, I have to mention this, the state of the world here is demonstrated really well in this moment. Even before we leave the Temple of Time, the lighting is darker and grimmer feeling than when we came in. But when we actually emerge back out to Castletown, we find it completely in ruin and taken over by Redeads. This site is something that has just always stuck with me as being among the best moments of world building in Zelda. It was only moments ago that we stepped out of the bustling Castletown market only to find this horrifying site. It just gives me chills. Moving on, after racing the now deceased Dampe's ghost, we will get the hookshot and be able to head to the Forest Temple. Navi may also chime in saying she's worried about what may have happened in Kokiri Forest during our seven year absence, which is fair considering look what happened to Castletown, a guarded place with soldiers. Heading into the forest, we'll find things aren't looking good for the Kokiri either. We're immediately attacked by enemies in this once peaceful village, and all of the residents are hiding in their houses out of fear. Even though these are really simple enemies, like Deku Babas and Scrubs, the Babas are huge compared to the ones we've faced up until now, especially considering Link's increased stature. Hey, can I mention that as much as I like this segment where you're sneaking around this maze, the Moblins here have some of the dumbest enemy AI in the entire series. Anyways, heading over to where we first found Saria seven years ago, we find that she's missing. If we play Saria's song to try to communicate with her, she'll say that she's relieved to hear you're okay, and that the forest spirits were calling for help, so she's headed off into the forest temple. So now that we have the hookshot, we can ascend up to the previously out of reach ledge and actually enter the temple itself. There is a reason this dungeon often comes up as people's favorites. It's a personal favorite of mine at least. The Forest Temple is an absolute masterclass in its design, 
its progression up the difficulty curve, its atmosphere, and thematics. While all three of Child Link's dungeons felt like pretty natural real locations in this world, this one stands out from everything we've seen up until this point. Rather than a giant tree in the forest, a cave in a mountain, a fish in the river, which are all pretty logical locations, we instead find what appears to be an abandoned fort or castle, mansion, or some other structure hidden at the very back of the Lost Woods. A fortress with brick, stone, and even carpet, lost to time, becoming overgrown and retaken by nature, while spirits still wander the hallways. While not as natural in its design, the mystery and stark contrast in this design choice makes its atmosphere even better in my opinion. It's also impossible not to talk about this dungeon's music. The Forest Temple theme is absolutely perfect to me. There's just the right level of ambience, mixed with a certain optimism that phases in and out. The instruments blend and shift in their levels. It's not what one would assume or think of when you hear forest-themed level, but neither is this architecture. And this juxtaposition of our expectations with its perfected sound design really elevates the experience of this dungeon to another level. In my opinion, it's one of the series' absolute best pieces of dungeon music. This dungeon is also a step up in difficulty, which is particularly great for Link's overall story. Since this is our first outing as adult Link, now wielding the legendary Master Sword and trying to save the world from a ruthless and evil ruler, it makes total sense that the enemies and puzzles we'd face in here would be in another league from everything we've seen before. Entering the foyer, we are immediately ambushed by two Wolfos. Up until now, we've only been forced to fight a Wolfos once as Child Link. That was a single Wolfos and was treated almost like a boss in its own right. But having to take on two of these guys simultaneously, right off the bat like this, is sure to test your mettle. These guys are way more of a challenge than the crappy Moblins we fought outside too, because they actually block, defend, and dodge, as well as time their attacks. Spin attacks are particularly useful for breaking their defenses, but charging it up also leaves you vulnerable to attack, so you may take that risk, or try a quick spin attack, or focus hard and time your attacks for those key moments when they leave themselves vulnerable. Once they're defeated, you can make your way to the next room, but first you have to make sure you inspect every nook and cranny of every room, because it may be very easy to walk through that door and miss out on the key that is hidden at the very top of the foyer room. Up until now, there has been no keys hidden in the dungeons, so unlocking doors has usually come down to finding a switch or completing a puzzle. Now if you aren't using your big old brain and looking hard enough, you can come full stop to a locked door that you can't pass through. So you have to keep in mind not just the room at hand, but the dungeon as a whole bigger picture in order to progress. And it's absolutely essential that you be curious and explore everywhere you can, otherwise you just may find yourself stumped at a dead end. This dungeon also combines two elements from the previous two dungeons' designs that I thought worked really well, and bloody well perfects them. We have in its layout the wonderful interconnectivity that Dodongo's Cavern first showed us, as well as the unraveling style progression on full display in Jabu Jabu's belly. Now here's how this dungeon accomplishes that. Proceeding through the foyer and past the hallway where we can easily dispatch this Skulltula thanks to the new hookshot we have, we come to the central room. In this central room are doors that all connect to pretty well the entirety of the dungeon. So six paths total before us. Four Poes appear and remove the flames from those torches and disperse themselves to the various parts of the dungeon. When they do so, the central elevator, which happens to lead to the boss room, is closed off. So that eliminates one of the six paths immediately. The door to the east is on a ledge too high up to reach. The door to the northeast is locked via an eye switch, which you can't activate yet. The door to the west is also locked. The door to the northwest is blocked by time blocks, and so the door to the north is the only truly open path. 
However, you can play the Song of Time to remove the time blocks and open the northwest door, and if you nab that key in the foyer, you can unlock the west door immediately. However, that's not necessarily the best order for you to tackle these things. The game has left that north door open and ready for you to head into, so I always felt like this was a pretty strong hint as a starting point. Particularly because through that north door is one of the only sort of one and done paths that doesn't progress you much. Heading north will encounter a pair of Stalfos who, like the Wolfos before, are a great challenge for combat. Best these guys and you'll score a second key. From here, if you decide to head into the west room, you'll end up hitting locked doors. You'll actually need three total keys to progress down that path. So the next best option is to head into the northwest door by removing those time blocks. Through here, we'll find the first courtyard room. There's a well here that we can't do much with, and so the only way to progress is by scaling the vine wall at the far end of the room and heading through the door. This brings us to a small adjoining room, which contains the map. The adjoining room bridges the upper levels of the two courtyards, so heading through the next door logically brings us out onto a balcony in the east courtyard which mirrors its western counterpart. You can use your hookshot to zip over to another balcony, where you can press a switch to drain the wells in both courtyards, which as it turns out are connected via this lovely brick tunnel. Here we'll find our third small key. Now that we've gotten the map, explored a fair amount of the dungeon, and gotten our keys, it's time to head back through the central room, spend one of our keys to unlock the western door, and ascend upstairs. In order to get up to the second floor, we'll have to complete the sliding block puzzle room. The puzzle for progressing here is pretty simple, but I like that it forces us to use these blocks to build our own path up through this room, which is great as a puzzle on its own during your first trip through this room, but also means that if we have to backtrack through this room at any point, say, for example, if you missed one of the keys earlier, then you can quickly climb up through the blocks you've arranged in here, rather than doing the puzzle over again. Now that we're at the top, we'll spend a second key to enter the first twisted corridor. As if the mysterious ghost-filled abandoned fort vibe wasn't cool enough already, the play with physics here is pretty impressive. Also, take note of that ornate treasure chest on the wall in this room. We'll come back for that soon. Passing through here, we'll spend our third key and find ourselves in the first portrait room. You'll notice the first of the four Poe sisters, Joelle, hidden here inside of the portraits on the wall. If you approach her, she'll vanish and hide in one of the other portraits. So we can't do much here except for head down the stairs and into the next room. We'll find ourselves ambushed by Stalfos once again, and directly above the northern Stalfos room from before. So don't fall down the hole in the floor or you'll have to backtrack quite a bit to get back up here. For some reason, the Stalfos can just walk on the air here. Figure that one out. Defeating the pair here brings down a platform with reinforcements, so we'll actually have to defeat four in this room total. Doing so will net us this dungeon's item, the bow. I have to say, having both the bow and the hookshot this early on is wonderful. Now that we have this, we can use it to fire at the Poe sisters hiding in their portraits in either direction from this room. Doing so, we'll draw them out into the open, where we can fight them head on. Defeating Joelle from before will get us another much needed key, and moving forward to defeat the second Poe sister, Beth, in the next room will get us the compass. But we can't progress further east this way, so we'll need to make a very short backtrack using our new bow to hit the eye switch we passed earlier in the sliding block room in order to untwist the twisted corridor and nab the boss key from that ornate chest we saw before. Untwisting this room also opens a new path here, which will take us out into the upper ledge of the western courtyard from before, where we can nab another much needed key. The next door loops us back around the block room, so we can quickly get back up to the second floor while reducing backtracking to the central room. Retwisting the corridor and passing through both portrait rooms takes us over to the second twisted corridor. Except it's not twisted yet, so we'll need to carefully hit the switch in the next room to twist it up, which opens a path just like in the western equivalent. Carefully passing through the checkerboard room with the falling ceiling, watch out for that by the way, we'll find a small puzzle with some push blocks which will take us right into our confrontation with the third Poe sister, Amy. After defeating her, the next hallway brings us up to that out of reach eastern door in the central room, where the final sister Meg waits for us. Meg is our final combat challenge before the boss. Meg's fight here is different from that of her sisters. 
She'll make duplicates of herself, and you'll have to make sure to be precise and only hit the real one. It won't take long to take her down, and with that, the central elevator rises, and our final path is open. After taking the elevator down to the small basement room, we'll need to tackle one more puzzle involving rotating this room to access different switches in the branching rooms here. I like this puzzle conceptually, but it's just a little too easy in my opinion. You can just keep rotating the room clockwise and you'll get through it all fairly easily. Now we find ourselves facing the final locked door to the boss room. When you first enter the boss room and ascend the stairs up to the central platform, you'll find the room to be empty. Paintings adorn the walls on all sides and the carpet sports an ornate design, but otherwise, there's nothing really of note here. It's not until you try to leave that she'll be suddenly locked in. The music cuts out and Link hears the familiar sound of a horse behind him. Turning, he'll be met with a familiar sight, Ganondorf, on his horse, just like from seven years ago. Except it's not really Ganondorf himself. This is Phantom Ganon, an evil spirit created by Ganondorf in his own image. Talk about vanity. Like Baronade, this fight is broken into two phases. The first phase sees Phantom Ganon hiding in the paintings, just like the Poe sisters, but he'll pop out to launch an electric attack that has a huge radius of damage. Little known tip though, if you stand on one of the Triforce symbols in the corner of the arena, you'll be just barely out of reach, and you won't have to worry about his attacks. You'll need to use the dungeon item, the bow, to hit him as he's transitioning between the painting and the room. After hitting him enough, his horse will ditch him and leave him stranded in the room. At this point, he'll use his trident to launch energy balls at you. Navi will tell you to answer his attacks with an attack of your own, which, although a bit vague, is a decent enough hint that you can use your sword to deflect his attacks back at him, in a classic match of Dead Man's Volley. You may find yourself deflecting a single attack back and forth quite a few times, its speed increasing with each strike. This is thrilling, I never get bored of this. If you manage to hit him with his own energy, he'll be grounded and open to attack. So make sure to seize the moment and rush him with some sword strikes. <laughs> Once he's defeated, he'll start to burn up and die, just like the bosses before him, but you'll hear the voice of the real Ganondorf intervene. He'll remark that you've gained some slight skill and that Phantom Ganon was simply a worthless creation. Fighting the real him will be much harder. Rather than allowing Phantom Ganon to die peacefully, Ganondorf instead banishes him to the void between dimensions. Brutal. After grabbing our heart container, we are out of here. But rather than being warped outside, we find ourselves back in the Chamber of Sages, where we see Saria for the first time in seven years. She now understands her destiny and is awakened as the Sage of the Forest. With another medallion collected, we are off. We find ourselves back in front of the deceased Deku Tree, where we meet the freshly grown Deku Tree Sprout. Since the curse on the forest is broken, a new Deku tree can now grow, and all of the monsters in Kokiri Forest are gone too. He also tells us that the reason we have aged and grown up while the rest of the Kokiri remained children is because, well, Link is a Hylian. He's not a Kokiri. He was orphaned and raised among the Kokiri children as one of their own. With that exposition out of the way and the threat eliminated from the forest, we're off. So that's the dungeon. Overall, this dungeon has some of the best atmosphere, a wonderful balance of combat and puzzle solving, and the perfect marriage of interconnectivity in its layout and the unraveling linearity in its progression. It's optimistic when it needs to be, it's spooky and dangerous when called for, and most importantly, it's just the right amount of challenging. It implements design ideas that future dungeons and even later games would take notes from, and balances this with unique concepts that we've only seen here. My one in only gripe is that that northeast door from the central room is actually completely pointless because you'll both enter and exit that connecting room through different doors already. So there's actually no need to ever have that door there, aside from making the dungeon more symmetrical in its layout. But aside from that one super tiny thing, this dungeon is darn near perfect in my eyes. This is not to say that the other dungeons are bad. In fact, we've still got some great ones ahead of us, but this one has always been among my favorites.
on our quest to reawaken the five sages from the temples across Hyrule, we've managed to liberate Kokiri Forest from its monster infestation and awaken our childhood friend Saria as the sage of the forest. Navi tells us that something funky is going on in Death Mountain, which you probably noticed as soon as you stepped out of the Temple of Time before. There isn't nearly as much mandatory story stuff required to do before going to the dungeon, but Sheik will move out of the way and allow us to freely travel between adult and child time periods, which is a nice bonus, especially if you want to go and grab any missed secrets or side quests. Aside from that, there is a ton of optional content to do if you so choose, and while not mandatory, there is a secret area in the upcoming dungeon that you'll want to get the Scarecrow's song for, so that never hurts to unlock either. Heading over to Death Mountain, we'll find things feeling a little more dangerous than before, but nothing we can't handle with a little bit of caution. Goron City, however, is almost completely abandoned. All of the doors are sealed shut, and only a single lone Goron can be found rolling around. He won't stop to talk to you either, so you'll need to lay a bomb in his path to stop him. Yep, this is Darunia's son, who is named after you. Your actions in Dodongo's cavern seven years ago have cemented your status as a Goron hero. Darunia's son tells us that Ganondorf decided to make an example of the Gorons by committing genocide. Yup, he has imprisoned all of the Gorons in the Fire Temple and plans to feed them to an ancient dragon named Volvegia, who he resurrected. The good news is that Darunia is the descendant of an ancient Goron hero who previously used a powerful hammer to smite the dragon, so Darunia has headed off into the Fire Temple to try and free his people and slay the dragon. Link here, the Goron Link, asks that you go help his dad, and gives you the red tunic, which gives you heat resistance. The statue in Darunia's room can be moved aside to lead us into Death Mountain Crater, where we find the entrance to the Fire Temple. Temple is a place of worship for the Gorons, but has been taken over and repurposed by Ganondorf. It's built into the crater of Death Mountain, and its structure extends upwards in two columns, the exteriors of which can actually be seen in Death Mountain Crater's Spectacle Rock. Indeed, the way this dungeon sticks out from the outside world is one of its stronger points as far as world building goes, but there isn't any shred of doubt that we're in the heart of an active volcano here. Pools of lava are all too common in the dungeon's many rooms, and it's too hot for Link to actually survive without his protective red tunic. Even the enemies all seem to be ablaze. While the Forest Temple seemed more like an abandoned fort or mansion, the name Fire Temple is lived up to in this level's design, enemies, and architecture. This is pretty believable as an actual temple. The music here is pretty spot on for this level's atmosphere as well. The track fades in with a drum beat, which makes a lot of sense since Goron culture has a pretty strong connection to its drums. In fact, it sounds almost like it could be the same MIDI drum sound that they used for Goron Link in Majora's Mask. There are also two layers of what I'll call this chanting choir that fade in and out of each other. At first this song felt a bit too generic dungeon to me, listening to it again I've grown fond of it actually. It's not as complex as the forest temple theme, but it's Goron style drumming and choir layers make perfect sense for what this dungeon actually is. I also just have to quickly mention that I do not have the version 1.0 cart of this game. The version I have has the updated fire temple music, but if you do have a version 1.0 cartridge, you'll notice that the chanting is quite different. It is definitely more unique because the choir layers in the updated version 
I think were actually repurposed from the Shadow Temple music, as far as I can tell. The original chanting was apparently a sample of a real-life Muslim prayer, but because I'm not bilingual or Muslim, I can't speak further to that. It's a pretty well-documented change between version differences, so I won't get too into it. Nintendo at this time had a pretty strong policy against religious references in their games, so I can understand removing that track. But I'll say that I am pretty sure I have version 1.2, which has some bug fixes, as well as Ganondorf's blood being changed to green, and the updated Fire Temple music. With that out of the way, both versions are pretty good, and while I think from a strictly musical standpoint that the original is the better and more unique version, the synth choir in the updated version does a fair enough job. The synth choir is a bit more generic, but the way the levels are mixed to fade in and out does have a mysterious ambience to it that works well enough for me. This dungeon also falls right in line on the established difficulty curve. While its progression structure isn't as interconnected as one larger puzzle, like the Forest Temple, the dungeon instead opts for a more linear, gauntlet-like approach, filled with rooms that all have individual challenges to them. While I prefer the larger picture that the Forest Temple paints, the Fire Temple still manages to shake up its structure here and throw some really fun challenges our way where the Forest Temple had a central room from which the whole dungeon weaved in and out of, this dungeon instead follows a linear progression that has small branches off of these rooms. But we won't be doing anywhere near the amount of crisscrossing or backtracking here, unless you accidentally fall, because while its design isn't as interconnected in its progression, this dungeon's structure is also largely vertical in its design, bringing us to a record five floors. Though many of these floors don't have as much going on in them, some of these rooms are really large and open in their design. But on the flip side, some, like the second floor in particular, have pretty much one tiny room and that's it. When we enter the dungeon's foyer, we'll immediately have four doors ahead of us. Two on the lower and two on the upper level. The lower door on the left is a dead end that teases us with the boss key, which we can't actually get yet. The lower door on the right is actually completely blocked off, so you may not even know that there is a door there to begin with. The upper door on the right is also locked, so we only have one way to progress, the door on the upper left, which takes us face to face with our old pal Darunia. He's glad to see you after all this time and ask for your help. He will go face off with the dragon Volvegia, while you go free the captured Gorons that are imprisoned throughout the temple. Though he does express being nervous because he doesn't have the hammer that his ancestor used to smite the dragon generations ago, he still heads on without you, locking the door behind him. The platform to the boss door is also completely out of reach, so we definitely have no way to pursue him at this time. Immediately in this room we can free the first Goron and get our first key. As we meet and rescue the Gorons imprisoned in the Fire Temple, they will also give us hints about how to solve the different puzzles or defeat certain enemies throughout the dungeon. Though most of their hints are basically just to use bombs on stuff, so thanks tips. Now that we have the key, we can head back through the locked door in the foyer and into the closest thing that this dungeon has to a central room. If we cross this room and try to proceed forward, not unlike the Forest Temple, you'll get stuck on two locked doors. So make sure to free the trapped Gorons on both ends of the off-shooting rooms here, so that you can also get the keys from those rooms. But mostly to free them. The Gorons deserve better than this. Through the first locked door is a small puzzle in which we push this block onto a fire geyser to propel ourselves up to the next floor, where we will spend our second key on the next locked door. The puzzle in this room is pretty straightforward as well. Push the block here to make a path that we can climb upwards, and make sure to hit this switch, which will briefly extinguish the flame in our path. Though it's much easier to just huck a bomb down there to give ourselves extra time, rather than trying to rush up as quickly as we can. Climbing up now brings us to the third floor, where we will enter the maze room. Make sure you explore every little corner of this maze so you don't miss out on freeing any of the Gorons here. There's actually two mandatory keys to get before we trek through the locked door and into this room with the narrow bridge. There's two paths paths from this room. One where we hit an eye switch and can snag the dungeon map, which is unusually far into this dungeon in my opinion, and the other which will bring us into this room with the firewall that chases us. It's not hard to outrun this thing at all. There's two paths in this room, but the western door is locked so we will need to head through the far north door, which actually spits us out to the upper level of the maze room. There's a completely optional room you can get to here if you got the Scarecrow Song, which will net you 200 rupees and two gold scotulas, 
but that is not required to progress through the dungeon. More importantly, however, there are two more Gorons to rescue here, one on the upper level of the maze room, and another we can find by bombing the floor here, and dropping back to the second floor room from before. This also has the added bonus of creating a shortcut back up to this point. Now that we can unlock the western door of the flame wall room, this pretty much wraps up everything that we need to do in the eastern half of the dungeon. That door brings us across a bridging hallway into the western half of the dungeon. This brings us to a second maze room, but rather than being obviously a little maze to run around with, it's more in the form of these pillars and flame walls that we have to carefully navigate. In order to get through here, you'll need to find your way to the locked door on the left side of the room, zip through this little prison room, and back into the right side of the room. There's a little puzzle here where we need to press this switch to extinguish the flames blocking the door, and of course, it's on a timer. The next room takes us into the battle against our first mid-boss, the Flare Dancer. He's not too hard. You have to ground him by using bombs, but because of how quickly he moves, sometimes it's easier to just hold the bomb and tank the hit yourself. Once his flames are out, you can attack him head-on with your sword. And once he's defeated, you can take the elevator up to the next floor, which has another timer puzzle in the same vein as the one on the second floor, allowing you to reach the very top of this half of the dungeon. This top room parallels the optional room on the eastern half of the dungeon, forming a very nice sense of symmetry in the dungeon's layout. Completing yet another timer puzzle here, which apparently this dungeon just loves, will score us the dungeon item at last, the Megaton Hammer. I'm surprised at how late into the dungeon this important item is found, to be honest, but it is awesome. You can use it in combat for absolute overkill of your enemies if you want, though it does lack the range that your sword can give you. Otherwise, it's great for puzzles, because you can activate these rusted over switches or break things that you previously couldn't with your sword or with bombs. We get some good practice in with this item's destructive power right away as well, since we can strike these blocks to open a new path, which actually loops us back into the fire maze room from before. Using the hammer to hit this rusted switch, we can now go and rescue that trapped Goron, grab one more mandatory key, and quickly snag the compass. Next, Navi will give us a nice hint to use the hammer to strike the top of this pillar, which drops us all the way back down to the pre-boss room where we saw Darunia before. Essentially, this dungeon has made us work our way all the way up to the very top and dropped us back here after we finished everything upstairs. Convenient. However, since we still don't have the boss key that was teased to us at the beginning of the dungeon, we'll want to use our new hammer to unlock that previously inaccessible door in the foyer. A couple small rooms in, we'll come across a second flare dancer, who we dispatch even more easily with the hammer, before coming into the other end of this room from before to free one final Goron and grab that that boss key. We've now freed all of the prisoners and collected everything we need. You know what's next. When we enter the boss room, Darunia is nowhere to be seen. As soon as we set foot on the central platform, the room will shake as our enemy appears before us. The subterranean lava dragon, Volvegia. I love his design here. It's no wonder he inspired such awesome concept art for this game. This fight will see us playing a game of whack-a-mole as Volvegia rises from the various holes in the floor. You'll want to smash his face in with our new Megaton Hammer to leave him vulnerable before attacking him with your sword. He'll also take flight to evade your attacks, though you can still hit him with your bow while he's in the air. It just isn't nearly as effective as the hammer, though. He'll also attempt to drop rocks from the ceiling on you, so you'll want to be careful to evade those. The more you damage him, the more he'll also try to psych you out during the whack-a-mole part of his routine here, so be on your toes or you'll get knocked down by his flamey hairdo. After a few good hammer hits to the face, he should go down in one of the most dramatic boss deaths this game has to offer. As his body burns up bit by bit, his skeleton breaks apart and his skull drops right in front of you. Yikes, dude. It's kind of too bad that he doesn't get a second phase to his fight, because I still feel like there is some untapped potential in Volvegia's design. But all in all, 
the fight is still a lot of fun. Once we've got our heart container we can warp out, we'll see a brief cutscene where it shows the state of Death Mountain returning to normal, then Link is dropped into the Chamber of Sages. As it turns out, to probably nobody's surprise, Darunia is revealed to be the awakened Sage of Fire. He thanks you for helping the Gorons, and gives us the Fire Medallion. Two down, three to go. So that's the dungeon. Overall, if I had to sum up its progression, the Fire Temple brings you up higher and higher, up a gauntlet of challenges, until you reach the top, where it will drop you back to the beginning in a large sort of loop. While I personally feel like there may have been some concessions made in its design, namely this huge optional area which you need to get the Scarecrow song for, which your average player probably wouldn't have known to go out of their way to get from Lake Hylia, there are still some great design choices here. This dungeon pushes us through a of smaller, fast-paced challenges in nearly every room in ways that we haven't seen much of before now. It does a great job of minimizing backtracking by funneling you through the few branching paths that it presents to you and having those paths loop back to your main course, and it raises the stakes in a big way by having us work to free the Goron prisoners. It's a dungeon that I think I very much took for granted, but its design choices are actually a nice shakeup from what we've seen up until now. While you may not have to spend as much time pondering over the map here like you might in the previous dungeon, this dungeon's theme is far more accurate action-oriented, testing us on our skill in volumes unseen until this point. It's a great change of pace, and I like it a lot. Next on our list is the Water Temple. But there is some important stuff that we need to do before we actually get there. Navi will hint at an arctic wind that's blowing from Zora's domain, but honestly, so far as Adult Link, we've just been retracing our steps and entering dungeons that are more or less in the same sections of the map as the dungeons we went through as Child Link, so it's not exactly a leap that players would think to go back to Zora's domain to see how things have changed over there. Upon entering Zora's domain itself, we'll find it entirely frozen over. The Zoras themselves are trapped below the ice, though we don't really see them, and the king is frozen in a strange form of red ice. If we walk on past him, we'll find that big fishy Jabu Jabu is actually nowhere to be seen, and there are these huge ice chunks floating in the water. By following along these platforms, we can find the entrance to the ice cavern. Yeah, okay, so let's back up a moment here. This is not the Water Temple, but rather a mini dungeon that we need to complete before we can actually get to the real next dungeon. I considered doing a video on just the Ice Cavern, but let's be honest here. It's frankly too small and simple to warrant a full-length video. It's better to just include it in this section of the video anyways, as having these sort of mini dungeons is pretty well how the pace of the rest of the game is going to go anyways. As far as the atmosphere goes, this place is pretty eerie. It's always reminded me of that scene from Empire Strikes Back where Luke gets captured by the Wampa on Hoth but I digress. The music, of course, matches perfectly. There's something about this instrumentation that gives off a sort of ice crystal resonation in my head. It just fits perfectly. Progressing through here is pretty simple, but that makes sense for this being the mini dungeon that it is. Down the entrance hallway we'll fight a couple of Freezards in this round blade trap room, before proceeding down another snowy hallway to the central room. There's three paths to take from here, but two are blocked by red ice, so all you can do is collect the silver rubies to unlock the door on the eastern end of this room. Taking the hallway down here gives us the map and a source of blue fire, which we can use to melt the red ice ice. For this reason, I recommend having gotten all four empty bottles already to minimize backtracking, though there's already a fair amount of these blue fire sources anyways, so you'll be fine even if you don't have all the bottles. Since we now have blue fire, we can proceed through the other two paths in the central room. The path to the south will give us the compass, and the path to the north will bring us to the sliding block puzzle room, where we will need to collect more silver rupees to unlock the door here. Once we've collected them all and the door is unlocked, Locked, we can proceed to the final room where we will fight the closest thing this dungeon has to a boss, that being a white wolfos. <laughs> By now we've fought our fair share of challenging enemies, so you should be able to take him on pretty quickly.
The chest here will reward our efforts with the iron boots, and Sheik will appear to teach us the warp song as usual, the serenade of water in this case. Sheik also explains how while all of the Zoras were frozen under the ice, Princess Ruto actually was freed and went off to investigate the water temple, which is apparently where the source of this ice curse is somehow. With the iron boots, we can take a shortcut back to the entry room, and we are out of here. While pretty simple, I actually like the ice cavern a lot. While generally unpopular, I am a sucker for sliding block puzzles in Zelda games, and there's just this eerie mood that is accomplished so well here. Considering its small size, there's also a lot of secrets hidden here, including three gold scotulas and a piece of heart, so it's worth being thorough. I also just have to mention real quick that the room where we fight the Wolfos is just visually one of the coolest rooms in the entire game. Before we use our new warp song to skip straight ahead to the dungeon, make sure to stop back at Zora's domain, unfreeze the king, and get your blue tunic, which will allow you to breathe underwater, which is going to be absolutely essential for the upcoming dungeon. Anyways, with all of that said, now that we have our new iron boots and blue tunic, we can reach the bottom of Lake Hylia, which I should mention is mostly drained except for a small portion, where we will find the entrance to the water temple. Honestly, the Water Temple gets a bad rap. It is by and large what many consider to be the game's most difficult dungeon, coming hot off the heels of the Fire Temple, <laughs> which is action-packed but pretty straightforward, I can see how it would give players a hard time. The Water Temple is not a gauntlet of challenges, obstacle courses, and battles like the Fire Temple was. It is instead a deeply intertwined labyrinth of locked doors. This is not to say that there are no battles and no challenges, because there are, but the dungeon's biggest obstacle is simply knowing how to navigate it. Like the Forest Temple, we have a large central room that nearly every part of the dungeon branches off from. But this central room actually spans three floors, some of which are only accessible depending on the water level, which you have to change throughout the dungeon, but can only do so from certain locations. There's a huge emphasis on this navigational challenge and of traversing underwater. Water, which can be especially challenging since you can't actually use your sword underwater. The only item you can use is your hookshot, which can deal some damage to your enemies, but remember that its main function is for traversal, not combat. So if you find yourself hitting locked doors, having to double back and getting mixed up turned around, then know you're not alone. You're sharing a sentiment shared by many of the Zelda community. This dungeon is the biggest challenge this game has thrown at us so far, but you know what? I love it. But worth a quick mention, here's some things that may alleviate your stress here. Number one, I've neglected to mention it up until now, but with King Zora unfrozen, it's worth doing the side quest to get the Big Goron Sword. It will help a lot since it does double the damage of the Master Sword. The game has actually done a really great job of teasing out this quest to us since we first emerged as Adult Link, and it's done really well. Number two, getting Feror's Wind from the Fairy Fountain near Zora's Domain is also worthwhile. Feror's Wind is a warp magic, so if you find yourself deep into the depths of the dungeon, up against a locked door that you don't have a key for, you can cast the spell to make returning to this point easier. In fact, this one is the only dungeon in the entire game that I consistently find myself using this spell in. And number three, use the map. The Fire Temple may have been a straightforward and onward kind of dungeon that looped you back to the main path whenever you needed to briefly stray off course, but here? Almost the whole dungeon is laid out in front of you from the start. Everything branches off of that central room, so there isn't a quote-unquote main path to adhere to. Instead, it is a matter of planning your actions, gathering the necessary keys, and seeing what paths work and what is a dead end. Hey, also, because I mention it in every video, can I just gush about the music here? It's actually beautiful. There's this distorted watery sound, perfect for the water temple, pleasant chimes or bells, a flute, and what is that, a sitar? I 
I'm not really sure, but whatever string instrument that they use here, I am totally in love with its sound. All of the instrumentation is used super well to create this brilliant ambience. There's a pleasant optimism in the bells, which cascade throughout the track, but there is also an air of danger and mystery. It's brilliant. The Water Temple doesn't have a real foyer like the previous two dungeons have had, so as soon as we enter we are standing at the top of this big square central room. As previously mentioned, this room is massive, spanning three floors. A central tower rises through the room, which houses interior central rooms, and of course there are so many doors. You thought having six paths from the Forest Temple's main room was a lot? There are four paths off of the first floor, three more off of the second, and four including the dungeon entrance from the third, and those are the ones branching outward. There's also two more doors for going in and out of the central tower. At least the Forest Temple's six paths only really had one that was unlocked from the get-go. Here, however, while many of them are out of reach and inaccessible, I think just this sheer volume of options right off the bat is part of what many players feel is so overwhelming about this place. My personal method is to just narrow your thinking down to just think about the floor you have at hand. If you think of this massive central room as a whole, you will drown <laughs> in options. If you take it slow and break each floor down, you should be able to reduce the amount of backtracking that you need to do and avoid feeling overwhelmed. Just try to find the balance between doing that and not losing sight of the bigger picture here. So we start off coming in the entrance from the south of the third floor in the central room. While here on this third floor, there are really only three paths before us. The door to the west is locked, so don't worry about that yet. The platform to the north is completely out of reach, and so that just leaves the hallway on the east side. There isn't much to do here, but make sure you at least start this puzzle of pulling this block back into place, otherwise later you will get stuck here. So obviously the third floor didn't have much for us, so we can start to move downwards. Because of the water level being where it is, there isn't really anything we can do on the second floor either, except for zip down the hallway, again on the east end, and nab the compass. Based on the water level here and the hookshot target being where it is, I'm pretty sure that we're actually meant to get the compass later, but we might as well just grab it right away since we can. I'll admit that getting the compass before the map always feels a little weird to me, but the sooner we can see where the treasure chests are on the map, the better. Sinking all the way to the very bottom floor, we can really start to make some progress here. There are four paths outward and one inward from here. The path to the north will bring us to a locked door that is also completely out of reach, so don't even bother with that. The path on the west is blocked off from a push block that we can't push, and the southern path is also a dead end that we'll need to bomb. However, we're underwater, so obviously we can't use bombs here. So there is only one way to actually go for now, which is once again the hallway to the east. Also take note of the little landmarks that are placed around down here, such as the dips in the floor and the torches. Down this hallway, we'll come face to face with Princess Ruto, who, much like Link, is now all grown up. She tells you that there are three places to change the water level in the dungeon, and two follow her up to the first one. She swims upwards, but when we follow her, she is nowhere to be seen. Also, take note again the breadcrumbs and landmarks that are being left here for you. There's this barred door and bombable wall. All things to revisit when the water level is at an appropriate height. At the top of this room, we'll play Zelda's Lullaby to lower the water level, but before you go back down, don't forget to quickly go into the next room and grab yourself the map. Since this room is a dead end, the only way to go is back down the way we came. Since we lowered the water level, we can now light these torches at the bottom here to open this door. The lit torch in the middle here seems to imply that you should use your arrows, but it's just as easy to use Din's fire. Defeating the enemies in this next room will net us our very first key. Alright, so far so good. Also, since we've lowered the water level, there's quite a bit we can do on the bottom floor here. The most obvious would be to enter the central tower door, but that will only take us upwards. And as per my previous recommendation, it's best to try and clear everything out of each floor as best we can before ascending to another. So make sure to take advantage of that lower water level to explore the other paths here. The bombable floor to the south is an optional room for a gold sculptula. The push block room will take us through a couple of rooms, including this whirlpool room, which has another key for us. That north door, however, is still totally out of reach. So now that we've got another key, we can go ahead into the central tower room. Ascending in the tower, 
we'll find the second place where we can change the water level. This will raise it up to the halfway point. So the bottom section is submerged, but the second and third floor are out of the water. Make sure to sink down to find another key hidden after a small underwater combat challenge at the bottom of this room. So with the water up to the second floor now, here is where I'm pretty sure we're supposed to have gotten the compass. But if you've already got it, you can instead turn your attention elsewhere. Make sure to quickly backtrack here back to that vulnerable wall that was halfway up the room where we met Ruto in order to nab another key. This may be one of the only hidden keys in the dungeon that I find completely counterintuitive to go out of the way for, but since the game has given us both the map and compass, at least we can see that there is a key hidden there to get. With that done, we can return to the second floor of the central room. The western door here is locked, but since the platforms here float to match the water level, it is now accessible. Don't worry about that I switched door to the southern end of the second floor here, since the hookshot target there is also out of reach. This path actually loops us back to a small alcove at the very top of the third floor in the central room. This actually allows us to raise the water level back up to the top level as we had originally found it. But since we have a key to spare, and now that that same platform from before has floated up, the locked door on the third floor of the central room can now be accessed. Still with me? This door takes us to this waterfall room, which gives us a nice little challenge based around using the hookshot to quickly ascend up the platforms up to the other side of the room. It looks straightforward, but if you aren't quick to aim with that hookshot, then it may be more challenging than it looks. The next room has another neat hookshot puzzle that involves raising and lowering the statues that have hookshot targets on them in order to get through the room. It's neat, but not too complicated. This next door, however, takes us into this huge empty room. I love this part to bits. We can see from the map that it does have walls, but the room looks more like an empty, endless swamp. It's a strange illusion. There's nothing and nobody here, and walking across to the other end of the room, all we'll find is a locked door. Turning around, we'll see a shadowy figure under the lone tree in the center of the room, and this begins our battle against this dungeon's mid-boss, Dark Link. Okay, before we talk about the actual fight, the build-up here is just great. First of all, bit of an easy-to-miss detail, but when we first enter the room, we can see Link's reflection in the water, but when we pass by the tree where Dark Link appears, that reflection actually disappears. The tension here, that he appears off-screen behind you as well, is just so freaking cool. Dark Link here is probably the hardest mid-boss in the game. A lot of his attacks will mirror your own, and he actually will have more health depending on how many hearts you actually have up until this point. After over two decades of playing this game, this guy still gives me a hard time. But this challenge is heavily alleviated if you got the big Goron sword. Normally Dark Link will block most of your attacks, however, something about using a stab attack with the big Goron sword actually allows you to break through his defenses, since your strike is lower to the ground than it is if you use the master sword. So 100% definitely do recommend using that sword for this fight. Once he's defeated, the illusion will be broken, and the room will fade back to its normal form. Still massive though. Our reward for defeating Dark Link is actually the long shot. The long shot is basically just the hook shot again, but with twice the range. Now, since we've seen a few hookshot targets that have been out of reach, those should be no problem now. Continuing, we'll find ourselves in this underground river looking room with these vortexes. Be careful to not get sucked in, but if you use the iron boots and hookshot well enough, then you should be just fine. At the end of this room, we will get another key, and the path drops us to the whirlpool room on the first floor, so we can quickly go back to the central room, go through that eye switch hallway that we now have the long shot for, and finish the push block puzzle from the very start of the dungeon to nab one more key. Now we can duck back to the bottom, go into that northern locked door that was out of reach before, and we'll find ourselves in this room with the rolling boulders and tektites. I recommend using your bow to take out these guys before trying to cross, just to avoid taking damage. Passing through here real quick, we'll find another puzzle sort of room in which we'll need to push this block onto a switch to raise the water level. Quick mention here, but I like the way they telegraph the bombable wall for you in here, in which the light subtly reflects differently on those certain bricks. It's a small detail, but a nice one. There's one more room to quickly pass through and we'll find ourselves having looped back to the boulder tech tech room from before, but in an alcove at the top of the room, where we can spend our last key to get to this hidden room with the boss key. Phew. 
Anyways, now that we have the boss key and we've found everything we need to, we can make our way back to the very top of the central room to check out that last out of reach ledge and make our way to the boss room. When we enter the boss room, we'll find it empty, with the exception of the pool of water here. Nothing seems out of the ordinary until Navi tells you that the water isn't normal. What? This moment strikes me as so eerie. It's one of those, it's quiet, too quiet moments. If we hop onto one of the platforms here, we'll be treated to a cutscene from the boss's point of view as it rises from the water and sneaks up on Link. Then we see it. This is Morpha, a giant aquatic amoeba. Morpha has the ability to control water. The only way to defeat him is to use your hookshot to yank him out and then lay down a beating with your sword. This is easier said than done though, as Morpha moves through the water pretty quickly. Try to also stay moving as Morpha can create tentacles to pick up and grab you. Morpha, like the water temple itself, kind of gets a bad rap. People think he's lame or not threatening, but when I see him grab and toss Link around the room like that, I feel its power conveyed to me right there. As long as Morpha is in the water, he's dangerous. While not the game's most difficult boss by a long shot, <laughs> the very concept of Morpha being this organism that can manipulate water is one of the coolest and most unique boss concepts that I would love to see revisited in a future game. Anyways, wail on him enough, and he'll go down, and quite literally, pop. The water drains from the room, we can grab our heart container, and warp out. We'll find ourselves back in the Chamber of Sages, Ruto is the sage, no surprise there, and look, Lake Hylia is restored to its normal state. Hooray! Just don't forget to grab the fire arrows. So that's the dungeon. Overall, I think people are too hard on the water temple. It is definitely the game's most difficult dungeon, but I feel like that makes sense. It should be harder than those that we've already completed. Its music and atmosphere is top notch, and even though I have some gripes with its navigational aspects, as long as you stop, take a look at your map, and think about where you need to go, you should be able to manage. Some gripes though, that last locked door always trips me up. It always strikes me as counterintuitive to have to go back up to the second floor for that small key, so I almost always end up hitting this locked door, then casting Furore's Wind, and having to backtrack. At least with Furore's Wind, we can quickly return here once we've gotten that last key, but honestly, if that key were made a little less out of the way, and wasn't a puzzle that you'd have to start early on, then abandon and come back to once you've gotten the long shot, then it would go a long way to make this dungeon less confusing. Raising the water level to get to the boss room is also kind of a pain as well, especially because you have to go out of your way to do so twice. Yeah, since the boss room is at the very top of the central room, you have to raise it all the way up. But to even access the room where you raise it to the top, you have to first raise it halfway. If you know what you're doing, it's not so bad, but if not, then I can understand it being an issue. That said, the dungeon is also full of great ideas, fun puzzles, and the game's very best mid-boss. It is challenging, but since when is challenge a bad thing? The fact that it makes you have to stop and think is always something that I've liked about it. It's not my favorite, but I will die on this hill when I say that it is not anywhere near as bad as people make it out to be. In fact, I like it a lot. Also, the ice cavern is fun. Too short, but still fun. Alright, we have finished the forest, fire, and water temples. There's some debate about the quote-unquote correct dungeon order at this point in the game. Navi's hint seems to imply the shadow temple, but if you talk to Saria via Saria Sung, she'll imply the spirit temple. The quest status subscreen also seems to indicate that the spirit temple should be next, and really, as far as progressing through their respective dungeons, the items obtained in the shadow and spirit temple don't have much impact on each other. All that said, every guide I have indicates that the shadow temple is first, and really that's the way I've always played it. As far as the difficulty curve goes, as well as thematics in relation to the game's story, it just makes the most sense this way. Odds are it was simply changed during the game's development somewhere along the way, which is why there are some breadcrumbs to imply the older order, but I digress. Since we've beaten the Water Temple, we can trigger this cutscene in which Kakariko Village is on fire. Sheik and Link get their butts kicked by some mysterious evil, 
that has escaped from the bottom of the well. Sheik tells you that Impa headed off into the Shadow Temple. Anyways, if you try to enter the dungeon, you'll get this hint at the very start that you need the Eye of Truth. So much like the Ice Cavern and Water Temple, we will need to go and complete a mini dungeon before we can actually head into the Shadow Temple. In order to enter this mini dungeon, you'll need to make sure you have learned the Song of Storms from Guru Guru at the Windmill, which you can use as Child Link to drain the well by making it rain somehow. Anyways, buckle up for literally my childhood nightmares as we head into the bottom of the well. The implications of the bottom of the well are really quite dark. There's an old man in Kakariko that tells you that some guy who had a way of always seeing the truth had a house where the well now stands. So is this the remains of the underground basement of this guy's house? And if so, why is it full of corpses and torture equipment? In all honesty, my personal headcanon has always been a combination of these elements. It feels to me like it's a portion of the actual Shadow Temple that through some underground cave-in or some other means was blocked off or inaccessible from the rest of the main dungeon. It even shares the same dungeon music as the Shadow Temple, but more on the music later, as well as its architecture and themes. But then how could it be a part of the Shadow Temple and also the remains of this ancient person's basement. And this still doesn't exactly explain all of this nightmarish stuff here. It's food for thought though. However, that's all theory territory, and this is a dungeon design analysis video, not a theory video, so we'll just move on for now. Bit of a personal origin story here, however. I can trace back my interest in reading maps and delving into dungeon design right to this very dungeon. Why? Because this place scared the bejesus out of me as a kid. So I was very keen on minimizing my time in here. Now, as an adult, I prefer to explore every single nook and cranny in order to 100% complete the game. But back then, if I could avoid being in any room with a re-dead, then that's what I'd do. So if you're like child me and would like to avoid spending any more time here than you have to, here's how you can be in and out of the bottom of the well in less than 10 minutes. As soon as you enter, get past the Skulltula and through the first hallway. In the large main room, loop all the way around to the back of the room and drain the water. Loop back around to the front of this main room, drop down to this ledge. Since the water is drained, you can now crawl through this space here. Climb up the ledge, go into this door, defeat the boss, and grab the Lens of Truth. Now you just have to backtrack a short way to the entrance and you are out of here with minimal childhood trauma. Okay, but you'll miss a lot of the goodies if you do it this way. So here's how, if you care about completion, you should actually progress through the bottom of the well. When you first come through the hallway and into the central room, you can pretty well take your pick of any of the holes in the floor that you can drop into. Heck, you may just stumble into one by accident, since you can't even see most of them without the lens of truth. You'll find yourself in the basement where you can obtain the map. Grabbing these silver rupees in here will unlock the door at the top of the ladder, which takes us back up to the main floor. You can sneak around through one of these invisible walls in the interior of the central room to grab this large chest with the compass. You'll have to make sure to approach it this way, as if you try to take the obvious route, you'll fall back down to the basement again. Now that we have the map and compass, we just have to comb through the dungeon to get the rest of the goodies, including a key hidden just around the corner from the compass, and a second one just a little farther down the hall. You can nab yet another key in this coffin room on the far west side of the dungeon. There's a lot of pointless treasure chests around here as well, which mostly have things like rupees or deku nuts. You can pretty well head for the boss room at this point if you want, but if you comb through the rest of those locked doors, you can grab some gold sculptulas as well. Heading into this boss room, we'll find yet another case of the old childhood nightmares. When you first enter this room, you'll find it empty with the exception of these creepy hands extending out from the ground. Nothing will happen until you let one of those hands grab you. At that point, dead hand will emerge. In my honest opinion, Dead Hand is, hands down, the most nightmarish and creepy enemy in the entire series. You can only hurt him by striking his head, but just to add to the tension and creepiness, you can only reach his head if you do the following. Let Link get grabbed by one of the hands, causing you to be unable to move. Let him approach you in his creepy little way, and wait for him to lower his head as he tries to bite you. The fact that the only way to break through his defenses is to put yourself at risk only makes this fight more scary. You can kill the hands if you want, but a new one will always regrow to take its place. The best tactic I know of is to break free from the hand's grip as quickly as you can and then charge up a spin attack. That way, when he lowers his head, you can hit him with the powerful attack, which also has ample reach. 
Defeating him gets us the Lens of Truth. With the Lens of Truth in our hands, we can either use it to make sure we didn't miss any secrets, or simply head out. As just a quick note, I recommend having gotten the upgraded Magic Meter by this point as well, since using the Lens of Truth will allow us to see hidden secrets, invisible objects, and etc, but will do so at the cost of magic power. With that said and done, we can return to the future, use the Nocturne of Shadow, light these torches, and head into the Shadow Temple. The Shadow Temple is honestly one of the most straightforward as far as its progression goes, even more so than the Fire Temple. In fact, I personally think it's one of the easiest dungeons this game has to offer, but what it lacks in difficulty is made up for in its creativity, unique designs, ideas, themes, and atmosphere. And of course, it's scary as heck. So even though it may be simple from a progression standpoint, especially right after the Water Temple, this dungeon was always hard for me to get through because, like the bottom of the well, there are rooms that floor to ceiling are made of skulls. There's torture devices, blood stains, guillotines. You get interrupted with these cryptic messages from spirits that linger throughout here. And of course, most of the enemies are of the nightmarish undead variety. The dungeon's biggest challenge is just pushing yourself through it mentally. It's done wonderfully. Also, just as a side note, but whereas most dungeons typically have your main floors and a basement or two, the designers chose specifically to label each floor in this dungeon under basement, which really just hammers in that scary underground descent idea further with just a small change in text. Oh, and the music. It's not exactly easy listening, but dang if it doesn't do its job. The entire time we have this drumming, which feels like at the very least a hint towards the boss looming at the end of the dungeon. If you aren't familiar with who that is, you'll get why that makes sense later. There is, like the fire temple, these chanting choir voices throughout. But where the fire temple sounded more like a proper choir or prayer sort of chant, these ones sound downright haunting. Literally. This would do well enough as it is, but then they hit you with this harpsichord sounding instrument that scales in and out, and it never fails to send chills down my spine. Whereas the previous dungeon's tracks went the route of mystery and ambience, this track just makes you feel uneasy and unsafe. Due to its straightforward descent, I like to think of this dungeon as having a sort of three-act structure that you'd normally see in plays and film. The first act being the top floor with all the crisscrossing leading down to the large open room, the second act being navigating all of these small side rooms off of the large open room, and the third act being in which you take the ferry ride, nab the boss key, and fight the boss. Because of this linear three-act structure, I'd argue that this is the dungeon with the least amount of backtracking, but being straightforward isn't necessarily bad. The Water Temple, for example, was quite complicated from a navigational standpoint, but the atmosphere of the dungeon was actually fairly tranquil. Here because we aren't stopping to plan, the tension is never lost, as we have to press onward constantly. So let's take a look at that first act. As soon as you enter the dungeon, you'll need to hookshot across the gap in the hallway here, where you'll be prompted to go back and get the Lens of Truth if you haven't already. You'll find this puzzle in which you need to rotate the statue to the correct direction. You can find which one is the right one using the Lens of Truth. Do this puzzle incorrectly, and you'll suddenly be dropped to your doom. Completing it successfully will unlock the door here. However, we can't actually reach that door yet, so we'll need to shelve that for now. If you look around with the Lens of Truth, you'll find a hidden door here. There's two square rooms off of here, with two more off-shooting rooms. The first one will get us the map. If we press on deeper this way, we'll have to have a rematch with Dead Hand. Ugh. Again, you can defeat him the same way as before, and as much as I could go on about his creepiness, I think we adequately covered that in the bottom of the well segment. Defeating him will earn us the hover boots. Now that we have these, we can cross that gap from before and move onwards. This takes us deeper underground to this Bemo's room here, which has three doors that we can go through. The southern door has this small Gibdo fight, which rewards us with the compass. 
This always seems like such an odd choice to me, that we get the map, compass, and dungeon item in such a short succession like this so early in the dungeon. But hey, since this dungeon has such a small amount of backtracking, maybe that was done out of necessity, so that you wouldn't accidentally miss any important treasure chests or keys. Anyways, if we cross the Beemos room into the northern door, we'll have a silver rupee challenge in this room with the spinning reaper statues, which will reward us with a key. We'll see the tail end of a shortcut that we'll have to create later, but otherwise we can move on. We can bomb this last wall in the Beemos room, spend that key on the locked door, and head down this hallway, where we'll be ambushed by four Skullchillas if we're not careful. Oh, watch out for the guillotines. Act 1, check. We'll kick off Act 2 with this large open room. This being what I would say is the closest thing this dungeon has to a central room. Skipping past these guillotines, we'll fight a Stalfos and be faced with a fork in the road. If we skip across these invisible platforms and head left, we'll find a room with another one of these Reaper statues. Though this room is completely optional, but good if you want the gold Skullchilla. The other path to the right will have us hover across this big block, can't imagine what purpose this serves, unlock the door with the silver rupees, and head into this room with the falling spikes of death type machine. This room honestly feels like a prison with these cells off of the sides. You can use the Lens of Truth to pull a block out of the wall, which you can use to prevent yourself from getting, you know, impaled. There's a few extra chests, another gold sculptula, and a key in this room to collect. Now we can cross to the last door in this large open room, spend that key, and we'll be in this room with the invisible spikes. There's two doors, but they are both locked. Kill the Redeads, collect the silver rupees, and it'll unlock the lower door. This next room with the giant skull torch thing will get us another key, which we can use to go back and unlock the upper door. This takes us down a hallway in which we need to use the iron boots to prevent ourselves from getting blown back by these big fans. At the end of it, there is again two doors. The first one only leads to an optional room where we will fight some redeads. The other, less obvious room will need to use the hover boots and wind from one of these fans to reach. Another simple room, kill the enemies, find the key hidden in the room, and unlock the door. This takes us to the end of the second act, but if need be, you can now pull that block block out of the way from here to create that shortcut back to the start that I mentioned before. Otherwise, we can move on. So Act 3 of the dungeon starts us on this ferry. We can play Zelda's Lullaby to get the boat moving, and we basically just have to survive the boat ride while it carries us across this huge chasm. All the while, Stalfos will board the ship and attack you. It's eerie and one of the dungeon's most unique segments, but especially if you have the big Goron sword, these guys shouldn't give you too much trouble. At the end of the passage, it starts to sink, so we need to quickly abandon ship. We'll find ourselves in this room with this big opening, but before we cross it, we'll head into this other room to the side. This maze sort of room looks empty enough, however you can only see the actual structure of the maze using the lens of truth. The room has a door in each corner, including the one we just came through. If we head into the door to the south, we'll find a key. The door to the west is an optional room with money and another gold sculptula, but the most important one is the door to the north, in which we'll find the boss key. Just make sure to react quickly enough with Din's fire to burn these wooden spikes, because this room is a literal death trap. Now we just need to cross this big chasm, which I'm really not sure how I ever figured this out, but we do so by firing an arrow at the bomb flowers at the base of this big statue, which falls into place to create a bridge. Great! Now we just spend that last key, pass through this room using the Lens of Truth and Hover Boots, and into the boss room. When we enter the boss room, we'll simply drop into the hole in the floor and fall down. Strangely, we take no fall damage, as we have landed on a strange floor that has a bit of bounce to it. And then the drumming starts. The ground we have landed on is a big drum, and we have just come face to face with its drummer, Bongo Bongo. Bongo Bongo is one of the game's most mysterious bosses. Very little is confirmed about his backstory, but he is certainly the center of a lot of fan theories. His design is grotesque, since he's basically a body with a severed head and hands, and a big ol' eyeball in place of where his bloody neck stump should be. Since his hands are severed, they can, and do, move freely from his arms to attack you. A lot of future Zelda dungeon bosses take notes and their basic design concept right from Bongo Bongo here. Though I do find it strange that he is the only boss in the game in which the dungeon item is not actually required to beat him. You can do this without the hover boots entirely. Instead, you need to use the bow and the lens of truth. But still, the formula is simple enough. 
shoot his hand with the bow, then shoot his eye, then attack with your sword when he's stunned. Pretty well the same as what we're used to at this point. Though that said, his attacks are pretty quick, so he will put up a fight. Pro tip, if you use the big Oran sword and crouch stab him, you can defeat him absurdly quickly. But if you choose to not exploit that, you can have a pretty decent fight on your hands. Once he's down, he'll melt away, and we'll see that he was in fact that mysterious thing that whooped yours in Sheik's butt before. We get our heart container, and Impa is awakened as the Sage of Shadow. So that's the dungeon. From a difficulty standpoint, the Shadow Temple almost feels like a step backwards from the Water Temple. The navigation is pretty straightforward, in which you'll keep hitting locked doors where keys are very readily available, and you won't be backtracking or crisscrossing an important central room. Instead, you're constantly traversing deeper and deeper into the depths of this dungeon. In fact, it's the only dungeon in the game in which the boss room is not closely connected to the dungeon entrance, which makes you feel more isolated from the world when you reach it. Living up to its name, the Shadow Temple paints a darker picture. The horrors in the Shadow Temple aren't really the doing of Ganondorf, but instead this sheds some light on the dark and bloody history of the Hylian royal family. There is a lot of implication here of something more sinister. Both the bottom of the well and Shadow Temple alike are some of the series' darkest and scariest dungeons, giving us a peek at the evil that those in power tried to bury. It's pretty messed up. Obviously, there is a lot of speculation and theorizing surrounding these locations, and that speaks volumes about how well these design choices were implemented. I would have liked for it to be a bit more difficult, but it more than makes up for that with its scary atmosphere. I like it a lot. Only one sage remains to be awakened at this point, and it's the first time in the game as Adult Link where we will have to tread entirely new ground. Navi gives us a nice hint saying that since Ganondorf is from the desert, we might find some clues there. Gerudo Desert was entirely inaccessible as Young Link, as the Gerudo have a blockade in place, which I guess they removed by the time we come here as Adult Link. However, the bridge over the Gerudo Valley is actually broken, so we'll need to use Epona to jump the gap in a totally worrying but really awesome moment. Side mention here, but the Gerudo Valley music is a freaking banger! One of the best single pieces of music in the game, nay, the series. It's totally a song I can just jam out to anytime. Mm -mm. Anyways, Muto here will tell us that his workers have all been imprisoned by the Gerudo, so he asks for your help saving them. We'll need to infiltrate the Gerudo fortress, find, and free the four carpenters. Only thing is, if any of the Gerudo spot you, they'll throw you into this prison cell, without disarming you for some reason. It's easy enough to deal with, since you can just hookshot up and out of there, so it's more of an inconvenience than anything. Anyways, you shoot the Gerudo guards in the face to, um, knock them unconscious, and sneak around. When you find each carpenter, you'll have a short fight with a Gerudo guard who will drop a key you can use to free them. After finding all four carpenters, this Gerudo warrior, who I'm just going to refer to as Avail, after her Terminian counterpart, will appear and say that she's been watching Link sneak through the fortress and is impressed by his skill. Avail offers Link a membership to join the Gerudo tribe as an honorary sort of member, which gives us free access to the fortress, training grounds, archery range, and etc. Fun bit of trivia, but in the N64 version of the game, Avail's clothes will actually always reflect links, so if you change right in front of her, her clothes will change too. I always thought this was something of a reference to Zelda 1, in which Zelda's clothes actually did the same thing, but it's apparently just a glitch, which is why this no longer works in the 3DS version of the game, as well as apparently some PAL versions. Anyways, if you want to do this side content, you can, in particular, I recommend getting the ice arrows from the Gerudo training rounds, not that you actually need them for anything, they're entirely optional, but totally just fun to have. If you do it now, there's one key that you actually can't get without the silver gauntlets, but you will still have enough to get the ice arrows. Anyways, now the Gerudo guards will open the gate into the desert for you. You can trek through the haunted wasteland by closely following these flagpoles, and then by following this friendly Poe. And eventually, you'll come out of the sandstorm and see the desert colossus itself. A huge statue of the sand goddess, which actually houses the spirit temple itself. However, if you try to go into the temple, you can't actually do anything. You'll need to go back out, learn the Requiem of Spirit from Sheik, so that you can warp back here as Child Link and enter the dungeon seven years in the past. <laughs> Oh. 
Oh man, that music. Its opening is dramatic, it's thoughtful, and I really want to talk more about this song, but I almost feel like my lack of musical know-how just wouldn't do it justice. But that said, it's actually so perfect for this dungeon. I mentioned before that my favorite dungeon in the game is the Forest Temple, and it still is, but this one is a really close second. The Spirit Temple lives up to its name in a lot of ways, and I think it's one of the dungeons in the game that explores its themes on a much deeper level. Then again, there's only so deep you can go with a theme like fire and water compared to a theme like spirit. The Spirit Medallion, and by extension, the symbol of the spirit element, bears a close resemblance to the real-life yin and yang symbol. This symbol Symbol represents the duality of the world and balance in this duality. So in a way, the spirit symbol in the Zelda universe could be interpreted as a duality and balance in one's own spirit. The game actually talks about balance in people's spirit quite a bit, such as when referring to the balance of one's heart if they attempt to take possession of the Triforce. This theme of duality is implemented in almost every aspect of the dungeon's design as well. There are two dungeon items, two sand goddess statues, one inside and one outside. You explore the dungeon in two halves, first as child and then as adult Link. The map layout has a great deal of symmetry, mirroring itself in two halves. There are puzzles that use light, especially with the mirror shield, light and dark being a big part of the yin-yang duality. Even the boss fight itself explores duality by putting you against a literal pair of twins. The temple's themes also run opposite that of the Shadow Temple. Whereas the Shadow Temple had us pretty much in friendly territory, and yet was a nightmarish, hostile place that showed us the darker side of Hyrule's royal family, showing us the bad that the good side is capable of, here is the opposite. The Spirit Temple is a temple built by the Gerudo. We are told that Ganondorf and his followers have been using it as a sort of base of operations. So really, we're in the heart of enemy territory, and yet, the temple has a rather peaceful, tranquil atmosphere. I mean, it's still a dungeon with threats and danger and all that, but that danger isn't built into the architecture itself. So we get a glimpse here of something good that can come out of a bad place. In that sense, these last two dungeons are a duality, a balance in themselves. Let's also keep in mind that up until this point, all we've known about the Gerudo in this game is that their King Ganondorf is a pretty bad dude, and that the rest of them are known for being thieves. Yet, here we see a more thoughtful, spiritual side to the Gerudo, and that is especially embodied in Naburu. We meet Naburu right here in the temple's foyer. She herself is also part of a duality, a counterbalance to Ganondorf. Naburu and Ganondorf are both leadership figures among the Gerudo. We heard about the exalted Naburu from Avail earlier, but where Ganondorf is this cutthroat, power-hungry, brutal figure, Naburu is compassionate. She can be a bit coy with you in her dialogue, but she is by no means evil. In fact, she is appalled that Ganondorf would steal from women and children and go as far as killing people, and so she plans to rebel against him. And that's where this dungeon really kicks off. As Child Link, we can crawl through this space in the foyer, so Naburu asks that we sneak in to find one of the dungeon's treasures, the Silver Gauntlets, and bring it back to her. Once we defeat all the enemies here, we'll be faced with three paths. The middle door, which is through a small crawl space, is locked. The two side paths actually loop back around, so I like to just go clockwise through these rooms. You can tell right away that this dungeon means business, as you'll be fighting harder enemies than you've ever had to face as Child Link aside from bosses. Right off the bat here, for example, a Stalfos drops in on you, which is the first time you'll have to fight one of these guys as Young Link. You can use your boomerang to hit this switch and make a bridge through this room. Then you can use Din's Fire to defeat the Anubis in the second room and pass on through. Though if you don't have Din's Fire for some reason, or you're out of magic power, you can carefully lure him into the right spot and activate the switch to set him on fire. But it's so much easier just to use Din's Fire. You'll need to collect the silver rupees in this third room, which will open up the fence in the middle of the room and create a bridge across. Then you can light these torches, which will cause this chest to drop down. Opening the chest will give us our first key. Now that we've been looped back, we can crawl through that central crawl space and spend that key on the middle door. This next hallway will take us up a climbable wall to the second floor. There's some enemies to fight here, most notably the Lazalfos that ambush you. You'll need to use bomb shoes to destroy this rock on the wall, which will shine sunlight onto this sun switch and open the door. Though bomb shoes are readily available throughout most of the game, especially if you found all of the treasure chests back in the bottom of the well, still, if you don't have any at this point for some reason, you can hit this switch to reveal a chest with, you guessed it, 
bomb shoes inside. This door brings us to the large central room with this huge sand goddess statue. I love the look of this room to be honest. The Gerudo text scrawled across the walls, the sand goddess towering over you, and that wonderful symmetry with these balconies. Make sure to push this Artmos statue down onto the switch below, which opens the door directly above you on the top floor of this room. While you're here, make sure to drop down to the center of this room, light these torches to make a treasure chest appear, and grab yourself the map. Unfortunately, there isn't anything more that Child Link can do here, so we'll need to head to the top and head through that door that we just unlocked. Next, head through this small staircase and into the sunblock room. This room has three puzzles in one. It's great. The first and easiest one, pull this sunblock into the ray of sunlight to unlock the doors. Then destroy all the Beemos in this room and you'll be able to collect the silver rupees, which will light one of the torches. Now light the rest of the torches and a treasure chest will be revealed. Inside the chest is a small key. Now we just head through that last hallway, spend that key we just earned, and we'll be in this western throne room. Sitting motionless on the throne is a bulky armored figure. This is our mid-boss, an iron knuckle. Iron knuckles are seriously tough. They take a lot of hits and they deal a lot of damage. Four hearts. That and they are seriously aggressive with their attacks. The fact that we're significantly weaker as Child Link doesn't help matters, since the Kokiri Sword only deals half the damage the Master Sword does, which itself only deals half the damage that the Bigoron Sword does. So depending on how you're playing, you might be operating on only 25% of the damage output that you're used to. That said, you can use your small stature to your advantage in this fight. As the Iron Knuckle swings their axe around aggressively, if you stay close and duck, you can pretty much avoid all of their attacks this way. Then when the opening presents itself, you strike. Make sure to take the route of avoidance though, because using your shield to block is just not even an option. Those axe swings are too powerful and will send you flying back. This is definitely the toughest mid-boss fight that we've faced up until now, and it's awesome. Once you've defeated the Iron Knuckle, head through this door, which takes us outside to one of the balconies. Well, I say balconies, but it's really one of the hands of the Desert Colossus. There is a treasure chest here, which has the silver gauntlets that we promised to get for Naburu. However, once we get them, we're interrupted by some voices, and this cutscene plays. Turns out that these two witches have discovered Naburu, so they kidnap her and suck her into this vortex thing. It's a bit unclear what's happened to her, but one thing is for certain, and that is that Naburu is out of the picture. Dang. At this point, we've done everything that we can here as Child Link, effectively having cleared out the entire western half of this dungeon, so all we can do is travel back to the future. As Adult Link, we can now wear the silver gauntlets, which allows us to move or lift heavier objects than normal. So now we head back to the Spirit Temple. Of course, we can't enter the same path as before since we're too big to fit into that crawl space. But with our new silver gauntlets, we can instead push this massive block and open up the path on the eastern side of the foyer, which again has three doors, just like its western counterpart. Hitting the switch on the ceiling will unlock the two side doors, and again, we'll need to find a key for the middle door. Heading into door number one, we have a pretty straightforward puzzle. Play Zelda's lullaby while standing on this Triforce symbol, and we can hookshot across to the treasure chest that appears, and get ourselves the compass. Heading through door number two from the Beemos room will bring us to this rolling boulder half-pipe room. Collect the silver rupees once again to unlock the door. Behind the door is possibly the most pointless empty room, which has a treasure chest with a key. Just watch out for the like-like. Now we can spend that key to unlock the third door, which just like before brings us up a hallway with a climbable wall so we can ascend to the second floor. And just like its counterpart on the western half of the dungeon, we have a hole in the wall with a sunbeam shining in. But the sun switch isn't placed right under the ray of light. So in order to proceed, we'll need to rotate this mirror to reflect the light onto the correct switch. This unlocks the door, and we are back in the central room. Technically, if you wanted to, you can access the child half of the dungeon from here, but there isn't really much to do there. There is also an optional door in the center of the bottom floor in this room, which we can open by using the Megaton Hammer on this switch in the top corner. This will simply create a shortcut back to the entrance, however, so I usually just don't bother with it. You'll want to get onto the statue's left hand, 
which you'll notice has the Triforce symbol on it, and play Zelda's Lullaby once again, which will drop a treasure chest onto the statue's other hand. You can hookshot over, and you'll find a key which we can use to unlock the eastern door on the top floor of this room. Is this feeling familiar? This first room on the third floor has some precarious walkways. You can use fire arrows to easily dispatch the Anubises in this room, which will unlock one of the two doors. Heading into the next room, we'll see a sun switch that we can't use, and this push switch that opens this door. This puzzle's a bit tricky because the switch has to be held down in order for the door to be opened, so you'll need to bait one of these Armos into stepping on the switch for you, and quickly head into the door before they step off of it. This takes us into the Eastern Throne Room, which has us fight another Iron Knuckle, just like before. His attacks are super powerful, again, but as Adult Link, we can't use the same tactic of ducking under his attacks like we did as Child Link. So instead, I prefer to just rush him with the big Goron Sword and try to take him down as quickly as possible. Just like before, this takes us out to the other side of the statue on the temple's exterior, where we'll find another treasure chest, this time with the dungeon's second item the mirror shield. Not only is this useful for those light puzzles, but it's also stylish as heck. Now we can go back into the previous room, use the mirror shield to reflect this ray of light, and activate the sun switch, which unlocks the other door, through which we'll find another key. Now we can head back into the Anubis room and unlock that second door. This is the only part of the dungeon that really deviates greatly from its western counterpart, as it takes us up farther than we could ever progress as Child Link. There's this climbable wall that shifts in place, and climbing it is pretty tricky, so I instead recommend using the hookshot to just zip up to the top. Quick mention here, but opposite the door at the top of this room is this platform with some hearts on it. It just feels so out of place to me. The model for this platform was clearly taken from the water temple, and for some reason it even has the water reflecting effect over it, despite there being no water here. It's weird. Now we're on the fourth floor, which only consists of a few small rooms. First thing we'll want to do is play Zelda's Lullaby to unlock this first door in front of us. This room almost feels like it was repurposed from the fire temple or something, having these fake doors that we can break with the hammer and these fire slugs, and of course that fire. The puzzle here is simple enough, shoot the eye switch to make a platform appear, hook shot up to the platform, press the button to extinguish the flames, and you can grab the boss key from the treasure chest. Now if we head back into the hallway and into the next room, we'll find ourselves in this large mirror chamber. You can prod the switch through the gate to open the door in the adjacent room. There's a Lazalfos and some cool light reflecting puzzles. First off is a sun switch at the start of the room which drops a treasure chest with some bombs in it. Then this section where the sunlight shines down on this mirror. You need to bomb the wall here, then rotate the mirror, which reflects to another mirror, which you'll also want to rotate so that it aims through the gate and back into the large mirror room. Now the sunlight should be reflecting directly onto this large mirror, so we can stand underneath it, use the mirror shield, and activate this sun switch. This causes the entire platform to lower down into the central room, taking us face to face with the statue of the sand goddess. If we use the mirror shield to reflect light onto the statue, its face will basically disintegrate, revealing a hidden door. We can hookshot across and spend the boss key to open this door. But it's not quite the boss fight yet. We'll find those two old witches again, Kume and Kotake, standing over another iron knuckle. They command the iron knuckle to attack you before disappearing. This particular iron knuckle is actually stronger than the previous two that we faced, but even still we can use the same tactic to quickly defeat them, only to reveal that it was actually a brainwashed Niburu under the armor. Twin Rova appear again, noting that she is back to normal. They comment that they should brainwash her again, but when she tries to make a run for it, they zap her. It's unclear if they teleported her away or if she's dead, but once again, poor Niburu is out of the picture too soon. Alright, we can head into the door behind her, down the hallway, and into the boss room. The boss room, as usual, seems empty when we first enter. The room has five raised platforms, one larger one in the center of the room, and smaller ones on each side. When we climb up to the top of the central platform, Twin Rova will appear through portals in the ground, which represent their respective elements, Kume with the power of fire, and Kotake with the power of ice. These two make for a really interesting boss fight, since this is basically the first time in the game in which the boss fight is not really against a big monster, but instead two powerful sorcerers 
monsters. They also have a lot more personality than previous bosses as they threaten you, talk to each other, and even laugh at you if you take damage. Possessing opposite powers means they're also vulnerable to the other's attacks, so the only way to inflict damage on either of them is to use the mirror shield to reflect one of their attacks at the other one. Sounds simple enough, right? But they fly around the room a lot, and so being at an optimal position in which both are in view so that you can reasonably angle these attacks can be tricky. I do sort of feel like there's a missed opportunity here to have been able to use the fire and ice arrows on them, but I understand that from a design and thematic standpoint, they wanted to make sure you'd have to use the mirror shield. After landing enough successful attacks, Twin Rova will decide to get serious and do some sort of weird fusion dance to become one being. Not quite sure how that works, or how two old ladies look younger when combined, but hey, don't you wink at me like that. For this second phase, rather than just reflecting the attacks back at them, you'll need to use the mirror shield to charge up three consecutive attacks from the same element. The mirror shield will store the energy from the charge, and after three, you can launch it back to ground her. Once grounded, you can attack with your sword. Just like with Bongo Bongo, if you crouch stab with the Bigoron sword, you can defeat them absurdly quickly. I find that strangely, this second phase of the battle is actually easier than the first, but Ah oh well. Once defeated, Kume and Kotake will appear again and, oh dang, they are for real dead. They argue with each other all the way up into the afterlife. We get our heart container, and back at the Chamber of Sages, we are reunited with Niburu. No surprise there, but she is awakened as the Sage of Spirit. Fantastic. So, that's the dungeon. As I mentioned earlier, the Spirit Temple is one of my favorite dungeons in this game, second only to the Forest Temple. It's a perfect balance of difficulty in its navigation and its combat challenges. Its themes of spirituality and especially duality are explored in every facet of this dungeon's design, from the statues that come in pairs, the opposing factions within the Gerudo, right down to the dungeon boss itself. It's the only dungeon in the game where the time travel theme that's, you know, in the game's title, is explored fully, since you have to enter as both child and adult Link. You could make the argument that the Shadow Temple does the same, but my personal headcanon aside, technically the bottom of the well is a separate area. Here, there is an actual overlap in the very rooms within the dungeon that you can enter in both time periods. Oh, and that sweet symmetry. I know, I keep mentioning it, but it really helps this dungeon not only feel like an actual temple, but it helps that duality theme come to fruition, since the child and adult halves of the dungeon mirror each other. Even more fitting then that one of the dungeon items is a literal mirror. Beyond all of that, it's a wonderful change of pace. The Gerudo have always fascinated me with how rich and fleshed out their culture is in this series, and that is on full display here in the Spirit Temple. I also love how the dungeon introduces these light puzzles and gradually expands on the concept by making these puzzles more and more complex complicated, until you're literally reflecting a single ray of sunlight off of multiple mirrors. It's good stuff. My small list of gripes, I hate these treasure chests with ice traps inside, it's just a nuisance. There's also a couple of elements here that feel out of place, like that one platform that looks like it was just ripped from the water temple, and this room which feels more like it belongs in the fire temple. I also kind of wish that the Gerudo typography seen throughout the dungeon was a bit more meaningful. A lot of the text seen throughout the series is actually translatable, but here here in the Spirit Temple, where there is text scrawled across huge parts of the dungeon, it's usually either gibberish or just the literal alphabet repeating itself. Missed opportunity. Why develop an entire fictional language just to spell out the alphabet on the walls? But aside from those very minor things, this dungeon is just downright wonderful, mysterious, and full of details. I absolutely love it. There isn't much to do before this dungeon, since this is basically the end of the game. Once all of the sages are awakened, Roru will tell you that someone wants to meet you at the Temple of Time. You can simply warp back there, and you'll find out that Sheik, who has been helping you throughout the game by teaching you the various warp songs, is actually Zelda in disguise. 
She gives you the light arrows and explains that she had to use this disguise to avoid being captured by Ganondorf all this time. However, since she's just revealed herself, Ganondorf immediately catches on, traps her in this crystal thingy, and teleports her to his castle. It's just a short walk over to see Ganon's castle. Since it's suspended over a pit of lava, we normally can't get to it, but since all the sages have been awakened, they use their power to build you a nice rainbow bridge. Okay, now this is basically your last chance to wrap up any side quests that you may have missed, but otherwise we can cross the bridge and enter the final dungeon, Ganon's Castle. Despite being the game's final dungeon, Inside Ganon's Castle is one of the game's easiest dungeons. As far as difficulty goes, I would place it being only harder than Dodongo's Cavern and Inside the Great Deku Tree, but that's just me. However, despite being pretty easy all in all, Ganon's Castle works well as the game's finale, since it brings together and combines elements that we've been introduced to throughout the entire game. It also has a healthy balance of the old Zelda formula, having the dungeon split into two halves, with the bottom half being entirely puzzle focused, while the top half is focused on combat. Also to quickly mention, the music in this bottom half, it is a track that I've always overlooked because it's almost entirely ambience. But if you listen closely, there's a pretty dark eerie atmosphere captured here. The song feels like danger is lurking around the corner. It's also interesting that there seems to be bits and pieces of previous dungeon music sprinkled throughout the song. There's a wind droning sound, which sounds similar to the beginning of both the Fire Temple and Ice Cavern tracks. This screeching sound from Dodongo's Cavern. A low choir sound, which brings the Shadow Temple to mind. It's pretty faint, but there's almost like a banging or rattling sound, which may or may not be a slowed down version of the same sound that is featured predominantly in the Forest Temple. Though, even I'll admit that last one is a bit of a stretch. Over all of these combined sounds is this harsh banging piano chord which really hammers in that element of danger. In all these years, this is probably the first time I've actually paid close attention to this song, and I have to admit that I'm pretty impressed with how it infuses elements from many of the game's dungeons. Despite the fact that it doesn't exactly make for a very memorable song, it definitely accomplishes its goal of creating this tense vibe. When we first enter the dungeon, we'll come down this hallway, past the two Bemos, and into the dungeon's central room. The door to go upstairs is blocked by this barrier, so in order to dispel it, we will need to take on the six challenges, which are themed after each of the sages and their elements. Mostly, that is. You can pretty much take them on in any order if you wanted to, with the exception that you definitely need to do the shadow section before the fire and light sections, because you'll need the dungeon item. So because of that restriction, I find that the easiest thing to do is to go right and tackle each of these rooms in a counterclockwise order. The first one will be the forest barrier. It's pretty straightforward, and in my opinion, is only loosely related to the actual forest temple. The first room has you light these torches, which I guess you could argue is similar to the overall objective of the Forest Temple, which has you hunting Poe's to relight the torches in the main room of that dungeon. You also fight a Wolfos here, which you fight in the foyer of the Forest Temple, but as far as I'm concerned, that's where the connection ends. The second room has this wind puzzle in which you have to collect silver rupees, which is a challenge encountered far more in dungeons like the Ice Cavern, Shadow, and Spirit Temple. Because of this, many speculate that this may have been left over from a cut wind dungeon, 
which is entirely possible. I always felt like this wind room would feel pretty at home in the Shadow Temple as well, since that's the only other place where these fans are found, and you have to use the hover boots to collect the silver rupees. Once you finish that, you can shoot a light arrow at this energy thingy, and that completes this section. Continuing on next is the Water Challenge, which also doesn't have much connection to the Water Temple in my opinion. Instead, this feels far more like a chunk of the Ice Cavern. The first room has some blue flame, which we can use to melt the red ice block in the door. Just make sure to take some into the next room as well, where you'll have a time limit to complete this sliding block puzzle. It's easier than the one in the actual ice cavern, however, you just have to push this block into this hole to seal it off, then slide the other block over it, around the room, and up to the ledge. Melt the red ice to access the switch, which unlocks the door, behind which you can dispel the water barrier. Next is the shadow section. You can use fire arrows to light the torches, which will make platforms appear over the gap here. Just be careful of the like-like when crossing over to the ledge. You probably won't have enough time to do it all in one go, so you can relight the torch to make it across to the next ledge, and down to the switch, which makes a treasure chest appear. The timer will most likely have run out by now, but you can hookshot back to the chest and open it to obtain the golden gauntlets. The golden gauntlets are basically just an upgrade from the silver gauntlets that we just got in the spirit temple, meaning they do the same thing, but now you can lift even heavier things. Great. Now all we have to do is use the lens of truth to walk along this invisible pathway. Hit the switch to unlock the door and head into the next room to dispel the shadow barrier. Next is the fire challenge. There's this big old pool of lava that many of the platforms in this room will slowly sink into. This one is easy enough. Collect the silver rupees to open the door. Just make sure you already have the golden gauntlets or you won't be able to lift this rock to get all of them. Then you can hookshot over to the door and dispel the fire barrier. The light themed section is next but to even get to it, you once again use the golden gauntlets to lift this rock out of the way. The light section is a bit odd because there wasn't actually a light temple that we had to do in this game, so the rooms here all sort of feel like they were borrowed from other dungeons. The first room has a bunch of invisible enemies, not unlike the shadow temple. This hallway in the second room has us play Zelda's lullaby to reveal a chest here. There's not a lot to go off of, but the shape of the hallway sort of reminds me of some of the hallways in the spirit temple. Then there's this rolling boulder room, which also reminds me of the spirit temple. Then finally, a fake barrier room with the real one hidden behind a fake wall, which again feels very shadow temple to me. Last up is fittingly the spirit section. The first room with this Bemos has a silver rupee challenge, which is made more dangerous by the blade traps. In the next room, you'll want to use bomb shoes to activate the switch on the other end of the gate here in order to proceed. Then burn the web covering this light on the ceiling and use the mirror shield to reflect light onto the correct sun switch. Now we can dispel the final barrier which opens the path to ascend upstairs. That wraps up the puzzle-centric first half of the dungeon. Just a side note, at this point now that we have the golden gauntlets, it's worth backtracking outside of the dungeon to visit the Great Fairy and get our upgraded defense, which is represented by these outlines around our hearts. This will reduce damage taken by half, so it's worthwhile to get before proceeding upstairs to the more combat-focused second half of the dungeon. Ascending the tower is very straightforward. We're basically following a winding staircase case upstairs through several floors, but with combat breaks on each floor. The first room has several fire keys which are pretty harmless. At the top of the first set of stairs we'll find ourselves in this room having to take on a pair of dino foes. If you haven't fought these guys before, they are basically just stronger versions of Lazal foes. But at this point, especially if you have the Bigoron sword, they should be easy to deal with. Now we go up some more stairs, fight a pair of Stalfos, and grab the boss key. Okay, more stairs. This next fight pits us against two iron knuckles. We have fought iron knuckles a few times in the spirit temple already, but never two at once. You could take them on one at a time, but I prefer to just go all out on both of them because I'm just like that for some reason. Again though, big Goron sword. No big deal. Okay, one final set of stairs and we'll be through the boss door. Just kidding, there's more stairs after the boss door. Despite there not being much going on while going up this long flight of stairs, I still love this moment. As we approach the top, Ganondorf's theme song gets progressively louder and louder. There's actually an in-universe reason for this aside from just building the tension, because Ganondorf is actually at the top in his room playing his own theme song on a huge pipe organ. It's a nice touch. Okay, so we made it to the top of Ganon's tower. Here. We. Go. With the power of the Triforce resonating, with its three bearers all together, Ganondorf stops the music and commands you to give the pieces to him. For some reason, this weird wave of magic makes it so that Navi can't help you with targeting him. Okay, we can still take him on though. Here we go. 
the final battle. This fight is basically a harder version of our battle against Phantom Ganon back in the Forest Temple. We need to deflect his attacks in a game of Dead Man's Volley. It may take a lot of back and forth, but eventually when his attack hits him, he'll be momentarily stunned, but not grounded. You'll need to take this opportunity to shoot him with a light arrow, which will give you the chance to attack him with your sword. It's not a very hard fight in my opinion, but the mood here is just so right. All right. Once he's defeated, his explosion of power will shatter the walls of this room apart and he'll collapse in front of you. Zelda will be freed and that's the end. <laughs> nope. The castle starts shaking. In a last ditch effort, Ganondorf uses his power to destroy the castle. We have a very Metroid-esque escape sequence where we have to follow Zelda out of the castle before time runs out. Only thing is that she is actually slower than you, so just stay close to her don't go ahead of her. It's fairly straightforward as well, though there's a couple of interruptions where you have to fight some baddies, but nothing unmanageable. Once you reach the bottom, the castle is completely decimated, and it's finally all over. <laughs> Just kidding. When you go over to investigate that noise, Ganondorf emerges from the rubble. And in one of my all-time favorite Zelda moments, he transforms into Ganon right in front of you. The atmosphere here is brilliant. The ruins of the castle, fire all around you, there's barely enough light to even see the action. Ganon is huge, and he starts the battle off by immediately knocking the Master Sword out of your hand. So you'll need to fight him with a different weapon. Some people use the Megaton Hammer, but I prefer to just keep on using the Bigoran Sword, since its long reach is especially advantageous. In order to deal any damage to him, you'll need to strike his tail. You can use light arrows to stun him, or if you're quick enough, you can roll right under him and be able to hit him that way. You also can shoot him right in the tail with the light arrows as well, but that's more of a drain on your magic meter than is necessary in my opinion. Just watch out, because his attacks deal a fair amount of damage. After hitting him enough times, he'll be momentarily winded, giving you the opportunity to retrieve the Master Sword. Now with the blade of evil's bane in your hand, you'll want to repeat the same process. Once enough damage is done, Zelda will use her sealing power to hold Ganon in place while you deliver the final blow. Beautiful. So that's it. That's the game. We know how this goes. Ganondorf is sealed, Zelda returns us to our time, so we miss that big party, and we accidentally split the entire Zelda timeline. In all honesty, I wasn't sure if I would even do a video on this dungeon, but I'm glad I did. This final challenge ties in elements from all across the game and wraps up the story so wonderfully. The dungeon and the final battle are about as climactic as it gets. I do wish it would be a little bit more difficult, but all in all, the vibe and thematics of it more than makes up for that lack of difficulty in my opinion. And I love it to bits. That's the end for Ocarina of Time, but per many people's requests, we will be tackling more Zelda games. Originally, I considered trying to cover an entire game in a single video, but I believe that splitting it into each individual dungeon has allowed me for more time to ponder over these elements, take a deeper dive, and do this game justice. I'd like to take a quick moment here to thank you for watching this video. And special thanks goes out to my channel members here on YouTube, as well as my supporters on Patreon. You guys make this all possible. So thank you to Greymage, Brenda, Tetra, Justin, Midnight Naomi, Bunny, and Stefan, as well as all of the folks whose names you're seeing on screen right now. You guys are awesome. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Bye-bye.